China is set to be the first nation in the world to field an aircraft carrier to truly rival America's fleet of supercarriers. But how good is China's first attempt at a supercarrier? And why would a fight between the two likely end with China's brand new carrier becoming China's brand new coral reef? The United States has been operating aircraft carriers for over 100 years now, while China is relatively new to the carrier club. This gives the US a significant advantage over China when it comes to running carrier operations, which are notoriously a very tough and dangerous lesson for nations to learn. The United States earned its stripes through many years of very dangerous training and testing, losing many pilots and deck crew in the process. However, China has shown it's a quick learner and has yet to suffer a major naval deck accident. While the plan has lost numerous aircraft as it learns to operate its new aircraft carriers, it has the benefit of emulating the nation that does it the best, the United States. Lessons learned from observing US carrier ops has significantly decreased the learning curve and reduced the price in blood China has had to pay to gain proficiency. But China is far from matching the United States when it comes to operating the most advanced types of warships ever created. Aircraft carriers are floating airfields, operating hundreds if not thousands of miles from home. They need to be able to launch very heavy aircraft at fast enough speeds to get them airborne and recover them by bringing them in from takeoff speed to a stop in mere seconds. Anything more complex than a routine training exercise requires careful coordination of hundreds of personnel and combat operations are something else altogether, with aircraft taking off and landing at the same time, a delicate ballet that the US has learned to perform expertly at a very high price in lives and aircraft lost. China has yet to show this capability, and while it has performed well in training cruises, it's yet to try the really hard stuff like combat-paced operations, such as launch and recovery at night and in inclement weather. The US Navy is an all-weather, 24-hour force trained to pressure an enemy relentlessly, giving no pause no matter how bad the weather is or how dark it gets. These types of carrier operations, however, are notoriously dangerous, and from time to time the US still manages to lose a plane or two. However, China has yet to attempt those more dangerous of carrier operations, and it remains to be seen how well its deck crews and pilots will perform when Mother Nature is beating down on them or in the dead of night. While they will likely learn to master inclement weather and nighttime ops, for now the US retains a significant advantage in this area. What about the physical ships though? How do the two match up? First, it's important to note that the very philosophy behind the use of carriers differs between the US and China. The United States sees its carrier as a global force capable of fighting and winning anywhere on the planet. If you start a mess, you can expect the US carrier off the shore of your country within three to nine business days. China, however, is incapable of global power projection due to a lack of large surface combatants and global logistics capabilities. Thus, its aircraft carrier is instead meant for regional operations, never far from the shore or support of shore-based assets. This is good enough for now, when the greatest challenge the Type 003 might face is a fight against a US carrier strike group for the Malacca Strait. However, if China wishes to dethrone the US as a global superpower and impose its will upon the world, then the Type 003 is not the carrier for the job. China's Type 3 will be conventionally powered, which already places it at a massive disadvantage against a Ford-class American carrier. US carriers are nuclear-powered, which not only makes their range infinite but comes with a host of follow-on benefits. For instance, without the need for refueling, US carriers don't need their own dedicated oiler to keep them in the fight. This significantly reduces an enemy's ability to disrupt a US carrier by targeting support vessels. The Chinese Type 3, however, will require constant resupply a link in the chain of Chinese naval operations that the US weapons are extremely well suited to breaking. Long-range stealth anti-ship missiles and the US's nuclear attack submarine fleet all pose deadly threats to support assets and will put pressure on China to fight more defensively than it would otherwise need to. The biggest advantage of the Ford's two powerful nuclear reactors, however, is their ability to generate more electricity than the ships need. This makes it possible to install future technology onto the ship without requiring a massive redesign or lengthy overhaul. The Type 03 doesn't have this capability and is largely stuck in the configuration it'll launch in. The US, meanwhile, is looking to soon add technology like directed energy weapons to its carriers and has more than enough juice to do so. US carriers are future-friendly. The Type 003 is not. However, this is hardly surprising. The Type 3 is China's first attempt at an indigenous carrier that can begin to match US capabilities. It's not a final design, so to speak, but rather one that'll influence the evolution of carrier design in the People's Liberation Army Navy. The Type 3 is also about 17 meters shorter than the Ford, 
at about 316 meters and a displacement of 80,000 tons versus the Ford's 333 meters and displacement of 100,000 tons. Mass is important in surface warfare because larger ships are simply more difficult to sink. As seen in U.S. naval live fire exercises on decommissioned carriers, U.S. carriers are incredibly difficult to actually sink. In 2018, Rear Admiral Liu Yuan of the People's Liberation Army Navy stated that the U.S. was so afraid of casualties that China could solve its territorial dispute with Taiwan and neighboring nations by simply sinking two U.S. carriers. Liu said, quote, We'll see how frightened America is after losing 10,000 sailors. Rear Admiral Yuan has clearly never heard of two things, the first, Pearl Harbor, and the second, a 2005 Sink X, where the Navy tried to sink the decommissioned aircraft carrier, the America. The carrier suffered four straight weeks of abuse of all kinds until she finally had to be scuttled by onboard demolition teams. However, it's important to note that the America was not being subjected to real weapons, but rather controlled explosives. The point of the testing was to see how to build better carriers to withstand combat damage, not to immediately sink her. However, not only did the America survive an intense battery of tests, but the Navy also took the lessons learned from the 2005 Sink X and put them straight into the fore. The USS America remains the only supercarrier to ever be sunk, and China is not privy to all the incredibly valuable information that the US Navy gathered from such an unprecedented exercise. There's no doubt that at a fundamental design level, the Ford is simply better engineered than the Type 3. There is one big improvement the Type 3 enjoys that the Ford shares, and the Chinese likely stole it from the US in the first place. While previous Chinese carriers employed ski jump style launch systems, the Type 3 will employ an electromagnetic catapult just like the Ford. This means China will finally be able to launch aircraft with full gas and combat loads, something it's unable to do aboard the Type 1 or Type 2. Electromagnetic catapults also significantly reduce complexity, decreasing maintenance and operating costs, as well as being able to be more finely tuned for various aircraft and payloads. This directly reduces stresses on the airframe and extends their service life. But how mature is Chinese technology over its American counterpart? Nobody knows, and the US has been having notorious difficulties with the Ford's catapult over the years that have taken time to iron out. China is standing on the US's shoulders and has been able to bypass a significant amount of research and development though. Aircraft are a carrier's primary weapon, and here China is definitely on the disadvantage. The Ford can carry up to 90 aircraft, with about three-quarter of them being combat aircraft. It's unknown how many the Type 3 will ultimately carry, but it's believed it'll carry about 40 fighters. This leaves the Type 3 outgunned against a Ford. But the types of fighters also matter, and once more, China is on the disadvantage in this area too. In March of 2023, the USS Gerald R. Ford deployed with its full air wing for the first time, Carrier Air Wing 8. Currently, the Navy plans to operate its Ford-class carriers with a mixed complement of battle-tested F-18s and new F-35Cs. By working together, the F-35s will be able to dramatically increase the survivability and lethality of their non-stealthy counterparts, as the F-35 can act as a miniature airborne control platform, guiding weapons fired by non-stealth aircraft safely out of reach of the enemy to their targets. However, the Navy is well on track to fully operate F-35Cs from its aircraft carriers as production continues to ramp up. A flying supercomputer, the F-35C is an aircraft with no peer in the Chinese arsenal. Its stealth doesn't make it invisible, but instead makes it incredibly difficult to acquire a weapons quality lock before it's already firing at you. This advantage alone makes it a lethal threat to Chinese air forces, but with its Block 4 upgrades which will supercharge this already powerful fighter with a host of new electronic warfare capabilities, the F-35s will receive a capability no other fighter in the world can match, the ability to escort itself through skies filled with dense enemy radar networks. The upgraded AIM-260 air-to-air missile will not just neutralize China's only real current advantage, but overmatch it, with a range of at least 120 miles. The US Navy will finally outrange the Chinese PL-15, which is estimated to have a range of about 100 miles. The F-35 will also carry the Advanced Anti-Radiation Guided Missile Extended Range, a weapon specifically designed to take on China's anti-access area denial defense systems. Successfully tested against a moving target on December 8, 2022, the AAR-GMER can engage enemy radar systems from outside of their threat envelope, keeping its host aircraft safe. Even if the enemy turns off its radar, the AAR-GMER can use advanced digital modeling 
to locate its likely target and leverage onboard sensors to correctly identify a powered down radar and destroy it. A missile believed to be China's new anti-radiation missile was spotted in 2020 under the wings of a J-11 fighter. However, little is known about its capabilities, though we do know that China lags significantly behind the US when it comes to sophistication of its weapon systems. The core of China's problem, though, comes from its carrier fighter, the J-15, nicknamed the Flying Shark. It's better known as the Flopping Fish in Chinese military media. The jet was based on a prototype Su-33 purchased from Ukraine, which the Chinese reverse-engineered, much to the chagrin of the Russians who've watched China buy sample sizes of Russian tech only to reverse-engineer them and make their own versions. In effect, China made the Wish version of a Russian carrier fighter with predictable results. The J-15 suffers from a common problem that all Chinese jets face – bad engines. The Chinese utilize WS-10 engines built by Shenyang Liming Aircraft Engine Company, themselves copies of Russian Salyut Layutka AL-31FN engines. However, developing aircraft engines is an incredibly complicated endeavor, and the Chinese have not shown that they're quite up to par. As such, the WS-10 significantly limits the operational range and payload capacity of China's air fleets. Recently, a J-20 was shown in flight with testing models of the WS-15, an indigenous design meant to overcome significant shortcomings of the WS-10. On paper, the WS-15 seems set to deliver the kind of performance that the J-15 desperately needs if it's going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with American fighters. However, as China remains one of the most opaque nations in the world on military matters, it's unknown just how capable the WS-15 engine truly is. What is known is that Chinese engines are notoriously unreliable. One American pilot remarked at the surprise of Chinese pilots when he told them how he had performed the circumnavigation of the Earth with his F-16 without significant engine maintenance. While the lifespan of US engines is measured in thousands of flight hours, Chinese engines are measured in the hundreds. The J-15 is also one of the chunkiest carrier fighters in the world, weighing in at 35,000 pounds versus the F-18 at 32,000 pounds. This is a significant problem when the plane is still stuck with inferior engines. With an estimated 60 J-15s in service, China also has a critical lack of combat-ready carrier planes to replace inevitable losses. The US Navy currently has about 30 F-35Cs and 273 on order, with 512 F-18s ready to roll. When it comes to numbers, the US is better suited to replace combat losses with better aircraft than China. But China is making strides toward developing the FC-31, a fifth-gen carrier-based fighter which has been spotted in flight testing. The US has stated that once operational, the FC-31 will be a significant threat to fourth-generation US aircraft, but it's unknown how it'll fare against US F-35s. It's also unknown when exactly the FC-31 will enter production or how many the Chinese will acquire. What is known is that China is lagging significantly behind the US, with the American Navy already designing a sixth-generation carrier fighter. The Air Force version of a sixth-gen fighter, known as NGAD, has already been confirmed to be in flight, so by the time China fields the FC-31, it might find the brief parity it enjoyed quickly overshadowed by more capable US aircraft. Ultimately, it's unknown which carrier would beat which in a one-on-one -on -one match, though overwhelmingly the signs point to a US victory. With far more experience than China and more mature and better technology in most areas, the US is simply the more competent combatant in this scenario. However, this is not a reason to diminish the threat that Chinese carriers can and will pose to US forces, as China has proven it's a very quick learner. And while it may lag behind the US technologically, the weapons China does field still present a significant threat. With only publicly available unclassified information to work with, the only way to know how each carrier would truly handle itself in battle would be for said battle to actually take place, a tragedy for the world at large as the planet's two biggest economic powers go to war. The People's Republic of China is huge. Not only is it the world's most populous country, with a population of around 1.404 billion people, it's massive land-wise. The country is approximately 3,700,000 square miles, making it slightly larger than the United States in land area. Although China spans five geographical time zones, the whole country follows a single standard time. China's home to 56 ethnic groups. Linguists estimate that there are nearly 300 living languages spoken in China, with Mandarin Chinese having the most speakers, around 955 million people. China is governed by the Communist Party of China, which administers the country from the capital of Beijing. 
The country is rapidly developing and is on track to become a superpower. Here are six places China is attempting to subjugate to expand its borders, economic, and global influence. Number 1. Tibet China has a long and volatile relationship with Tibet, beginning in the 13th century and throughout different periods in history. Tibet has been ruled by Chinese and Mongolian dynasties and has also been an independent nation. In the first quarter of the 20th century, Tibet was ruled by Great Britain before once again becoming an independent nation. In 1950, Chinese troops invaded Tibet to enforce China's age-old claim to the country. Some areas became the Tibetan Autonomous Region and others were assimilated into neighboring Chinese provinces. In 1959, after a failed anti-Chinese revolt, the spiritual leader of Tibet, the 14th Dalai Lama, fled the country and set up a government in exile in India. During China's Cultural Revolution, many Buddhist monasteries were destroyed and thousands of Tibetans were likely slaughtered during martial law. Due to international pressure, in the 1980s China somewhat relaxed its grip on Tibet and implemented reforms. Currently Beijing continues to modernize Tibet, sometimes at the cost of the region's cultural heritage. Development has brought Han Chinese migrants and Western tourism to the area. Since the early 2000s, there have been protests in Tibet, especially on the anniversaries of politically significant dates. Human rights groups say that China continues to politically and religiously repress Tibet. Various activists worldwide campaign for an independent Tibet. There are several strategic and economic motives China has for governing the region. Tibet is highly important to China's sense of self and Chinese nationalism. Many Chinese leaders, past and present, have believed that no matter the lines drawn on the map, Tibet is fundamentally a part of China. They felt a strong nationalistic drive to return China to its ancient, far-flung Qing Dynasty borders. Tibet also serves as a buffer zone between China on one side and India, Nepal, and Bangladesh on the other. The Himalayan mountain range provides natural security as well as a military advantage. China is currently struggling to find a balance between environmental issues and yet not hinder the country's economic industry. China is hungry for natural resources and Tibet serves as a crucial water source as well as possessing significant mineral wealth. Since the early 2000s, Beijing has invested billions in Tibet as part of its wide-ranging economic development plan for Western China. Number 2. Arunachal Pradesh China also claims that the region of Arunachal Pradesh, the northeasternmost state of the 28 states of India, is a part of South Tibet and therefore a part of China. Aside from India, Taiwan also claims the South Tibet region. Arunachal Pradesh borders the Indian states of Assam and Nagaland to the south, and countries Bhutan to the west, Myanmar to the east. To the north, the demarcation line, known as the McMahon Line, separates Arunachal Pradesh from the Tibetan area of China. Historically, Arunachal Pradesh belonged to neither China nor India, but was dominated by several autonomous tribes. In 1913 to 1914, representatives from Great Britain, China, and Tibet held the Simla Conference to decide on the borderlines for Tibet. The Tibetan and British officials agreed on the McMahon Line as the border between British India and Outer Tibet. The Chinese representatives refused the demarcation line and have considered it invalid ever since. When China invaded Tibet in 1950 and the Dalai Lama later fled Tibet, India supported the Tibetan government, angering China. During the Sino-Indian border conflict in 1962, China captured most of the area of Arunachal Pradesh but ended up withdrawing. In recent years, tensions have risen as China has publicly claimed the region of Arunachal Pradesh. China is especially interested in a small district called Tawang, which borders Tibet and Bhutan. China has even gone so far as to destroy thousands of maps and make new ones, having renamed parts of Arunachal Pradesh with Chinese names. India, while not growing as fast as China, is still emerging as a regional economic powerhouse. China wants to dominate Asia and sometimes seems to look for ways to clash with India. Most importantly, it's strongly assumed that there are heavy deposits of minerals such as gold and lithium in Arunachal Pradesh. A large-scale Chinese mining operation found gold and silver deposits worth around $60 billion in the Lunzi County of Tibet, which is directly adjacent to Arunachal Pradesh. Number 3. Aksai Chin China and India also clash over another border region, Aksai Chin, near Kashmir. Aksai Chin is mainly in Hotan County, in the southwestern part of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, with a small area on the southeast and south sides lying within the extreme west of the Tibet Autonomous Region. India claims Aksai Chin as part of the Ladakh region of the Jammu and Kashmir state. Aksai Chin is a remote, inhospitable region where mainly nomadic tribes roam. 
The area was ignored until the 1950s when China built a military road through it to connect Tibet with Xinjiang. India was angry upon discovery of the road and it ended up being a major factor in the Sino-Indian border conflict of 1962. At the end of the clash, China retained control of around 14,700 square miles of territory in Aksai Chin. In 1993 and 1996, the two countries signed agreements to respect the line of actual control, the demarcation line that separates Indian-controlled territory from Chinese-controlled territory in Jammu and Kashmir. Not only does China want Aksai Chin for maintaining a direct route between Tibet and Xinjiang, it appreciates the territory for its strategic position. Aksai Chin is mostly high ground with an average elevation of around 17,000 feet. If China ever goes to war with its neighbors Pakistan, Kashmir, and India, the Aksai Chin region will enable it to take a commanding high position. Number 4. The South China Sea As well as claiming disputed land, China has also claimed islands in the South China Sea. In fact, China has taken to dredging the sea and building out uninhabited islands such as Woody Island or the Spratly Islands to tighten its control over the region. Six countries, the Philippines, Vietnam, China, Brunei, Taiwan, and Malaysia hold different territorial, sometimes overlapping claims of the South China Sea, based on various historical accounts and geography. Adding to the tension, the US Navy frequently patrols the sea due to its alliance with several countries. China considers this to be a provocation. The South China Sea is very important to Beijing because it's a crucial commercial passage, connecting Asia with Europe and Africa. One third of global shipping, or 3.37 trillion US dollars of international trade, passes through the South China Sea. Furthermore, the seabed is rich with major oil and gas reserves. The US Energy Information Administration estimates the region contains at least 11 billion barrels of crude oil and 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Also, the South China Sea is a vital food source, accounting for 10% of the world's fisheries. In July 2016, an international tribunal in The Hague ruled that China had no historic rights over the sea and that some of the rocky outcrops claimed by several countries could not legally be used as the basis for territorial claims. Beijing rejected the ruling. More recently, some Southeast Asian nations have considered having bilateral talks with China to settle the dispute. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations Asian, has been working with China to create an official code of conduct to avoid clashes in the disputed waters. Number 5. Taiwan China has had an ongoing dispute with Taiwan for decades. It views Taiwan as a breakaway province that will eventually be part of the country again. But many Taiwanese citizens want a completely separate nation. Historically, Taiwan was a part of China. Taiwan was governed by China's Qing Dynasty from 1683 to 1895, when Japan won the First Sino-Japanese War. China had to cede the region to them. After World War II, Japan was forced to relinquish to China control of the territory it had previously taken. Civil war broke out in China in 1946 and ended in a victory for Mao Zedong's communist army. Chiang Kai-shek and his Chinese Nationalist Party, known as Kuomintang or KMT, fled to Taiwan. The KMT dominated Taiwan's politics for many years until after Chiang Kai-shek's death. Having inherited an effective dictatorship and under pressure from a burgeoning democracy movement, Cheng's son Cheng Qingkuo began assessing a process of democratization, which in 2000 led to the election of the island's first non-KMT president, Chen Shui-bian. Meanwhile, China treated Taiwan with great hostility. In the 1980s, relations between China and Taiwan started improving. China put forth the One Country, Two Systems plan, under which Taiwan would be given significant autonomy if it accepted Chinese reunification. Taiwan refused, but did relax rules for its citizens to visit and investment in China. Since the 1970s, the US has been a close ally of Taiwan and has sold billions in defensive weapons to the country. Currently, US policy in the region has been described as strategic ambiguity, seeking to balance recognition of China's emergence as a regional power with the US support for Taiwan's economic success and democratization. In recent years, China has been alarmed by Taiwanese citizens electing politicians who favor independence from China. Furthermore, the Taiwanese public has staged various protests about Beijing's policies regarding the country. Currently, Taiwan's legal status is unclear, in limbo. The country has its own constitution, democratically elected leaders, and its own armed forces with about 300,000 active troops. China wants Taiwan to return to the fold because of nationalism. Also, Taiwan being a part of China is a strategic defensive move. If Taiwan was to become an independent nation with its close ties to America, the US would likely have a naval port and military base in Taiwan, right on China's doorstep. Number 6. 
Hong Kong One final place where China is attempting to expand its power is Hong Kong. At the end of the First Opium War in 1842, part of Hong Kong Island became a British colony. Later, China leased the rest of Hong Kong, the new territories, to the British for 99 years. By the 1950s, Hong Kong had become a busy commercial port and a manufacturing hub. As the end of the 99-year lease approached, Britain and China held talks on the future of Hong Kong. In 1984, a deal was reached that Hong Kong would return to China in 1997 under the principle of one country, two systems. As a result, Hong Kong has a high degree of autonomy with its own legal system and borders, and rights including freedom of assembly and free speech for the next 50 years. However, in recent years Beijing has been treading on Hong Kong's rights. Artists and writers say they're under increased pressure to self-censor, and democracy has been limited. The current leader was elected by a 1,200-member pro-Beijing election committee chosen by just 6% of eligible voters. Throughout the spring and summer of 2019, large protests erupted in Hong Kong in response to a proposed bill permitting the extradition of fugitives to mainland China. Citizens worry the bill will be used to target, detain, and extradite political dissidents. Beijing's response to the protests has become increasingly violent as the citizens show no signs of backing down. China considers Hong Kong a bridge between Asia and the West for business and financial matters. Also, once again, China's domination of Hong Kong seems to be fueled by nationalistic fervor. With Russia hogging all the negative press lately, you might have missed Chinese President Xi Jinping's adamant proclamation that Taiwan will be reunited with the mainland. And he is not ruling out military force to accomplish this goal. But with the vast majority of Taiwanese citizens wanting nothing to do with mainland communist China and American President Joe Biden promising that the U.S. would come to Taiwan's aid, World War III is looking more likely and it won't be starting in Europe. How is China going to defeat the U.S. and its allies? And more importantly, why does Taiwan matter so much that the U.S. is willing to fight to keep it free and independent? China wants Taiwan and the U.S. wants Taiwan to remain free. Both sides have their various reasons, but there are some significant overlaps. For China, Taiwan is both a matter of national prestige and a national defense priority. The island is home to the Chinese nationalists who fled after losing the war against the communists after World War II. And given the difficulty of an invasion plus the support of the United States, reunifying this breakaway province by force has not been an option for China. It's only recently with China's vast modernization of its military and steadily expanding amphibious assault capabilities that the dream of taking over Taiwan is approaching fruition. But as long as Taiwan remains fiercely independent and refuses to bow to Beijing, China cannot be taken seriously as a global military power. After all, why should anyone fear your military when it can't even pacify an island sitting right off your own shores? For the Chinese Communist Party, Taiwan represents an existential threat, though. The nation began as a dictatorship but gradually became a liberal and open democracy. Today, it's amongst the most successful democracies in the world, and that's a big problem for the CCP. As long as Taiwan remains independent, it remains a symbol for the Chinese people of what life could be like for them if they were no longer under the thumb of the CCP. After the extreme measures enacted by President Xi during and after COVID, disillusionment with China's government and the very society it's built around has skyrocketed amongst the youth. To many of them, the democracy lurking right off their own shore is a more appealing choice, and as long as Taiwan remains independent, it'll continue singing its siren song of democracy to the Chinese people. However, there are two very real and very significant strategic reasons for China to want to take Taiwan back and for the U.S. to want it to remain independent. First is a Western strategy known as the First Island Chain. This is a chain of pro-Western friendly nations that ring the shores of China and Russia both. During the Cold War, it acted as a physical barrier to communist navies in case of war, who would be hemmed in and unable to operate in open waters without being destroyed attempting to break to the open sea. The First Island Chain also allows friendly navies to operate very close to enemy shores by having resupply and repair facilities readily available and not relying on far-flung bases which would limit loiter time for friendly ships and aircraft. Today, the First Island Chain strategy no longer hems in the Soviet Union and its allies and instead acts as a barrier to Chinese expansionism. China has attempted to break the First Island Chain by illegally building artificial islands in the South China Sea, and while the threat they pose is significant, it still doesn't allow the Chinese Navy to break the defenses of the First Island Chain completely, and it doesn't allow them to push hostile navies far enough away that Chinese shipping can continue to keep the nation supplied with the vital petroleum and natural gas it needs. Another strategic reason to want reunification with Taiwan could potentially impact the entire world, though. Today, Taiwan is the world's largest manufacturer of computer chips and semiconductors. 
wielding such significant clout that its embargo of Russia has all but crippled the nation's ability to build modern weapons. Taiwan's contribution to the global technology market is so significant that as the Chinese threat over the island grows, the United States has passed emergency funding for computer chip manufacturing plants to be built inside of America once more. If China were to seize Taiwan, it would in effect be in control of nearly all the world's supply of advanced electronic components and be able to threaten embargoes to nations that don't tow the CCP's line. A nation would have a simple choice, have its economy crippled or do as President Xi says. So how can China achieve its goals even if it means launching World War III and come out on top? China has already prepared extensively for conflict against the superior U.S. Navy, and has done a really good job of it too. The surface combat ships are still no match for American vessels, with China having approximately two-thirds of the total battle force missiles that the U.S. Navy has. Its air force is similarly outclassed by the U.S. Air Force, which not only outnumbers China's, but has far better capabilities in all but one department, long-range air-to-air missiles where the Chinese PL-15 enjoys a significant advantage over the American AIM-120 in terms of range. However, the US is fast-tracking an upgrade called the AIM-260 Joint Advanced Tactical Missile to not just close the gap, but exceed it once more. US air and naval power won't matter though if it can't bring all that might close to Chinese shores, which is why China has invested heavily into developing a strategy known as Anti-Access Area Denial, or A2AD. The goal is simple, keep American ships and special mission aircraft such as AWACS and tankers away from Chinese shores so the People's Liberation Navy can operate with impunity. At the core of the strategy is the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force, or PLARF. PLARF might sound like something you do after a bad burrito, but it's the gravest threat the US Navy has faced since the end of the Cold War, and it might be good enough to keep the US ships out of the Western Pacific for good. A ballistic missile force, this branch of the Chinese military is dedicated to China's vast stockpile of both nuclear and non-nuclear ballistic missiles. China was never subject to the Intermediate Range Force Treaty, or INF, and thus, unlike the Soviet Union and the US, China developed an extensive stockpile of conventional ballistic missiles. Today, China fields about 1,400 ballistic missiles alongside hundreds of cruise missiles. Most of these are older, shorter-range missiles which we could expect to see deployed against Taiwanese infrastructure, but hundreds have ranges capable of hitting US bases in Japan and South Korea. A small but unknown number can even hit the all-important US base in Guam. The PLARF would be critical in the opening days of World War III. Both the US and China hold serious counterforce power, and the advantage would go to whoever fires first. A war between the two powers would almost certainly be a bolt out of the blue attack, an unexpected first strike using hundreds of ballistic missiles. The targets would be US bases in the region, with a priority target being Guam. However, this comes with certain risk, as striking US bases in Japan and South Korea would threaten dragging those two nations into the conflict. South Korea may be disinclined to join the conflict out of fear of North Korea taking advantage of the situation. In fact, for China to win, it would be in its best interest to proceed a war in the Pacific with ramped up antics from North Korea, enough to rattle South Korea without actually crossing the line over into war. Fears of North Korean aggression would be likely enough to prevent South Korea from doing anything other than voicing public support for its American allies. Japan would be a different story. The two nations are famous rivals, and there's still a lot of bad blood between China and Japan. What's more, Japan agrees with the US that China presents a threat to democracies around the world. Losing a fellow democracy like Taiwan to China could represent a larger global shift toward authoritarianism. China, being the dominant regional power, is also greatly disadvantageous to Japan, whose all-important trade routes pass by close enough to China to be intercepted by its navy should Taiwan fall and the first island chain be broken. Thus, it's almost a foregone conclusion that Japan would join the war anyway, no matter what China ends up doing. The rewriting of its constitution allows the expeditionary deployment of its military, bucking the self-defense pacifist ideology of the past, and it's proof that Japan is actively preparing to send ships, troops, and planes to aid the US and Taiwan. This is a serious problem for China, because Japan provides a convenient staging ground for both the US naval and air forces. A significant number of ballistic missiles would have to be dedicated to striking Japanese air bases and harbors, in order to deny both to the US military. Chinese military doctrine states that the PLARF is to be used in a swift, precise, and overwhelming strike against an enemy force. This means eliminating the greatest threat to Chinese ambitions in the region, the United States Navy. It's not enough to shut down US bases and airfields. America has a huge expeditionary capability and lots of friends from where they could stage ships and planes. Winning the war in the Pacific means beating the US Navy black and blue. China is counting on the US's public aversion to military casualties to win the war the moment it starts. 
To achieve it, it needs to score huge losses to the U.S. at the onset of the war in terms of both men and material. That's why U.S. aircraft carrier strike groups are China's number one priority. Not only do American supercarriers threaten all Chinese naval shipping, but the loss of even a single carrier would result in the death of thousands of American sailors. This is something China hopes it can use to shock and awe the American public into not supporting a protracted war. Because China cannot win a long-term conflict against the U.S., simply lacks the material and ability to protect its trade overseas, while it can do nothing to threaten American global trade. With U.S. carriers kept at bay with ballistic missiles and friendly airfields destroyed, China would have a week or two to achieve its objective of capturing Taiwan. However, China faces three critical problems with its war plans. The first is that any invasion of Taiwan would take weeks to coordinate. Ships would have to be restationed to nearby harbors. Hundreds of thousands of troops would have to be moved from various military districts to the eastern one in preparation of boarding. Supplies like food, water, and medicine would have to be gathered in the millions of tons and prepared for shipping across the strait. Hundreds of aircraft would have to be moved to nearby airfields. Basically, an invasion of Taiwan would be anything but a bolt out of the blue. It would be a very publicly broadcast event that would have months of warning. The United States would use this time to gather global support for either painful political and economic measures against China or to build a national military coalition like it did in Desert Storm. In an unprecedented move, European NATO partners have been sending ships to the South Pacific in the last six months. These routine patrols are meant to signal one thing to China, Europe stands with the US and against an invasion of Taiwan. Invading Taiwan would mean taking on an international coalition. And there's no ready answer to this daunting problem for China, who enjoys few meaningful alliances and zero who would support it in war against what would in effect be a global force. The second problem China faces is that though its ballistic missile force is a deadly threat to U.S. forces, it might not be able to effectively deter U.S. naval operations the way China hopes it will. Hitting a stationary airbase with a ballistic missile from thousands of miles away is relatively easy. China has reduced the circular probability of error from 100 to just 5 or 10 meters for its modern missiles. However, hitting a fast-moving warship in the middle of the ocean is a different challenge altogether. Ballistic missiles and other standoff weapons need good tracking data to hit a moving target. This means that a ship must be first discovered, properly identified, and then finally fixed. China has greatly improved both its ground-based and satellite-based long-range radar capabilities, but this type of radar can only tell you a ship is out there with an approximate distance. Accuracy of satellites, however, is greater, though they provide only a temporary track as they orbit the Earth. In order to properly identify and then provide a good track, you need a much better sensor technology and it's unknown if China can foot the bill there. A vast investment in drones and AWACS aircraft means that China potentially has the tools to get the job done, but these airborne assets have to face the threat of the most capable air force in the world. China does enjoy an advantage here because the US would have to operate aircraft at extremely long ranges. But a decided uptick in both the purchase of air and sea drones by the U.S. military, as well as a new tanker drone, means that the reach of America's weapons is being steadily and greatly increased. Even if China can overcome the difficulties in hitting moving targets, there's still one Achilles heel it has no solution for, neither today nor in the projected future. China depends on overseas trade for the majority of its oil and natural gas imports. It does have two land-based connections to Russia, but one of these, the pipeline from Sakhalin, would make an easy target for a cruise missile strike via submarine. That would leave only one inflow of oil and natural gas in the far west out of U.S. reach. This would basically be a trickle compared to China's current fossil fuel supply, and within weeks the nation would run out of oil altogether. Its military could fight on for a few months at most due to the strategic reserves, but its economy would come crashing to a halt as the civilian sector becomes energy starved. To add insult to injury, over 60% of Chinese trade comes via the ocean. Except it wouldn't in case of war, thanks to the U.S. Navy. Even if its ballistic missile forces are effective at keeping the U.S. Navy at bay, ballistic missiles can't stop the huge U.S. attack submarine fleet. Surface task forces could also easily choke off China at multiple traffic choke points for maritime trade, including the Malacca Straits, the Gulf of Oman, and the Panama Canal. China is attempting to secure ports and airfields outside of the country so it can base forces near these strategically important waterways, but so far has only succeeded in gaining the use of a small base at Djibouti, only miles from a much bigger American base. With the bulk of the world on the U.S.'s ideological side and the vast network of friends and partners the U.S. can use to leverage pressure on anyone contemplating allowing China to build military bases on their territory, it's not predicted that China's forward-deployed military forces will grow in any significant amount.
The Chinese Navy may be the largest in the world today, but most of these ships are smaller vessels meant to act as missile boats or harass the fishing vessels and oil exploring ships of neighboring nations, not attempting to dislodge a U.S. carrier strike group from a vital trade artery. For all its planning, there's nothing China can do about this situation in the current or even long term, though it is steadily working at building a blue water navy capable of operations far from home shores. It still has a significant way to go to get there, however, and even the US remains firmly in the lead. It's late February earlier this year, and somewhere above the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea, a US Navy P-8 Poseidon aircraft is conducting routine surveillance of Chinese ships and installations along the group of remote reefs and man-made artificial islands. These islands have been built by China over the last two decades, as the nation lays claim to what it calls territorial waters, despite the fact that this territory is hundreds of miles from the Chinese coast and has been declared illegal by an international court ruling at The Hague. China, however, rejected the ruling and continued to build up its military presence on these faraway islands reclaiming land from the ocean and building runways long enough to accommodate Chinese warplanes, radar and radar jamming installations, and missile batteries. With the international community rejecting China's illegal claim to the area, the United States has routinely engaged in surveillance and freedom of navigation exercises in order to delegitimize the Chinese claim and to keep tabs on the military developments in the area. Today, a Navy Poseidon spy plane is approaching one of these artificial islands when, from thousands of feet below it, a Chinese Navy destroyer suddenly targets the American plane. Using an extremely powerful military-grade laser, the destroyer aims straight at the cockpit, sending dazzling light into the aircraft and temporarily blinding the pilots. Undeterred, the US plane continues its mission, but for a brief moment the world hung on the edge of its next major war. This incident is incredibly not a rare case. As U.S. ships and planes have pursued freedom of navigation exercises and intelligence gathering missions in the area, they've been routinely intercepted by Chinese ships and planes. But why is this going on, and how could it lead to World War III? Since 1947, China has laid claim to what it calls territorial waters within a nine-dash line created by the Chinese government at the time. This extends from the southern Chinese coast almost 1,000 miles all the way out to the coast of Borneo, and extends to Vietnam and the Philippines coast as well. The claim is not just illegal, but incredibly ludicrous. It would be like the United States claiming territorial waters, the entirety of the Gulf of Mexico, all the way to Venezuela. China, however, is undeterred, and in the early 2000s began a campaign of island building by reclaiming land from the ocean and building upon pre-existing reefs. This was a first attempt to legitimize its claims, as no nation can claim water around an island feature unless that island can be proven to support human life. China's answer was to shortcut that clause in international maritime law by creating an island where one didn't exist and then setting up troop barracks and flying in supplies. Surrounded by neighbors much weaker than itself, while the island building actions were condemned, they weren't challenged militarily. The last time a nation had dared to stand up to China was in 1988, when Vietnamese forces were dispatched to drive away Chinese incursion into an island within their own economic exclusion zone. A confrontation between Vietnam and the Chinese led to China killing over 60 Vietnamese Marines and destroying three Vietnamese Navy ships. China officially occupied the reef and has held it ever since. A similar incident was in the making later in 1994 with the Philippines, but the Philippine government, remembering the killing of Vietnamese Marines and sailors by the Chinese, decided to back down and allow China to occupy features within its own territorial waters. But why does China want this massive amount of ocean territory even when it's so far from home? Well, that's because this area of the world is relatively underdeveloped by the gas and oil industry and is home to some of the world's largest energy reserves that are still relatively untapped rivaled only by the waters around the North Pole. The U.S. Energy Information Agency estimates that there are around 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 11 billion barrels of oil in the area, with a 2012 U.S. Geological Survey estimating that an additional 160 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 12 billion barrels of oil are still undiscovered. This equates to trillions of dollars in untapped wealth, and China is willing to go to any lengths to ensure it gets it. To add to the economic prize of the region, the area is also home to some of the world's largest remaining fisheries, and Chinese fishing vessels are already plundering the territorial waters of the nations that ring the South China Sea. These fishing vessels have used water cannons to force the fishing ships of other nations away, and with Chinese Navy warships never far away, so far nobody has bothered to fight back. Only the United States has the military might to challenge China's illegal claims, and it has done so repeatedly. 
Undertaking what is internationally known as freedom of navigation exercises, U.S. ships and planes have routinely moved through the waters that the Chinese military claim as its own around the many artificial islands China has built in the region. Under normal international law, military warships of other nations must pass through the territorial water of a sovereign nation as quickly as possible through the most expedient route possible. The U.S., in a bid to delegitimize the claims by China, has instead opted to sail its ships in a zigzag pattern through the disputed waters, purposefully not sailing as expeditiously as possible, nor taking the most direct route possible. This places China in a difficult position as it can't legitimately claim national sovereignty when the warships of another nation flagrantly disregard that sovereignty. And unlike the small fleets of Vietnam, Borneo, Malaysia, the Philippines, or Burma, the U.S. Navy isn't so easily bullied away by Chinese ships. Instead, China has been forced to respond with everything short of outright force, often shadowing U.S. ships with its own or intercepting U.S. Navy planes on approach to the illegal bases China has built in the region. While so far this hasn't led to a serious incident, thanks on the part by restraint exercised on both sides, this year's laser-flashing incident was indicative of China's willingness to push the issue with potentially catastrophic results. Had the U.S. pilots been physically looking in the direction of the laser flash, the high-powered beam could have permanently damaged the vision of the aviators, potentially putting the entire aircraft at risk. So what if the U.S. Navy had lost the entire crew of a P-8 Poseidon? For the U.S., that would have meant the death of at least nine American sailors, as each P-8 carries mission support crew including intelligence personnel handling many of the plane's extremely sensitive instruments. With U.S. ships in the region already on high alert around Chinese installation and ships, the loss of an entire aircraft to direct hostile action by China could have immediate consequences. In all likelihood, the U.S. would attempt to use restraint and authorize only a tit-for-tat response, likely targeting and destroying an expensive but unmanned and Chinese military installation along the disputed island chains. If instead the Navy P-8 had been shot down by actual Chinese weapons, and not just accidentally downed by blinding the pilots, the response would be far different. The U.S. faces a very serious choice. If it refuses to take retributive action, then it threatens to at last fully legitimize Chinese claims to the area, not to mention lose major international face as it essentially bows to China as the superior Pacific power. This is… Well, unlikely, to say the least, and an actual shootdown of a U.S. plane by Chinese forces would likely lead to an overwhelming military response. That response, however, would be limited to the specific installation the attack originated from in a bid to allow China the option of not escalating the conflict into all-out war. China would have to accept the loss of what would likely be several missile batteries and a radar and communication station, along with the men manning those resources, or it could choose to escalate the conflict. Escalation would be unlikely, however, as, simply put, the U.S. is by far the superior power in the Pacific. While China can threaten U.S. forces with a large stockpile of ballistic missiles, its navy is simply no match for the firepower of the U.S. Navy. And most importantly, China has not yet demonstrated that it has the ability to keep its targeting networks for its ballistic missile forces operational past first contact with American forces. Even if, somehow, China's ballistic missile kill chain remains intact, an extremely dubious proposition, its total stockpile is limited, and once those missiles run out, it will be up to the Chinese Navy to fend off the U.S. Pacific forces, which would by then be bolstered by ships from the Atlantic fleet. This is a task it is simply not equipped to undertake. Further complicating problems for China is the U.S.'s vast fleet of submarines, an asset that is routinely overlooked by military planners on both sides, and that's something that the U.S.'s silent service, as it's known, is more than happy with. With an extremely limited anti-submarine warfare capability, China's navy would be decimated by this undersea fleet, and with the vast majority of its trade coming through the ocean, an economic blockade of China would lead to a catastrophic consequence for the nation. In the end, it's in the best interest of both sides that no such conflict takes place. While the U.S. would doubtlessly emerge victorious, it would be a costly victory with the greatest losses the Navy will have endured since World War II. With China as its greatest trading partner, the U.S. economy would take a huge hit as well. Though unlike China, the U.S. could redirect much commerce elsewhere. Still, a fully armed confrontation between the two nations would have dire consequences for the world and is not a proposition either side wants to see. And yet, China continues to build upon and expand on what detractors have taken to calling landlocked aircraft carriers in the South China Sea, unwilling to obey international law and continuing to bully its neighbors. 
This leaves not just the fate of the South Pacific, but the very peace and stability it currently enjoys hanging in the balance, and this time, it's China whose actions will determine what the history books say about war in the 21st century. If this scenario seems far-fetched, perhaps it's not as far off as one might think, as an armed confrontation very nearly occurred between the US and China back in 2001. On April 1st of that year, a US Navy reconnaissance aircraft was operating near yet another disputed Chinese encampment, this time on the Parcel Islands when it was intercepted by two Chinese J-8 fighters. In a bid to intimidate the Americans, one of the J-8 pilots undertook two high-speed flybys of the big US plane, but on the third attempt, the pilot completely misjudged his skills and rammed straight into the American EP-3E. The impact split the J-8 into two pieces and severely damaged the American plane, which was sent to an uncontrolled dive. Incredibly, the American pilot was able to recover the aircraft and severely damaged, it immediately sent a distress signal to a nearby Chinese airfield. The Chinese ignored 15 distress calls and finally, the American plane simply decided to land on the Chinese runway regardless of permission or not, as the pilot did not believe he could keep the plane aloft any longer. The only casualties of the incident was the Chinese pilot, who was likely crushed to death on impact and unable to eject. Immediately after the incident and despite the US releasing flight data from the onboard recorder, China claimed that it was the US plane that caused the collision by purposefully turning into the passing Chinese plane. This claim was in short ludicrous and largely ignored by the international community, especially since China never released the flight data from its own aircraft black box. Things in the South China Sea remain tense and a major incident between the two nations is only one provocation away. What happens next is largely in China's hands, but one thing is for sure, it is unlikely to back down from its claims in the South China Sea and sadly, conflict seems likely. In 30 years time, watching this video will be illegal in your country because China will have dominated the world. The Chinese Banksy, the man known simply as Badu Chao, recently had his exhibition in Italy protested by the Chinese government. Infamous for speaking out against the Chinese Communist Party, China lobbied the Italian government to have his show cancelled. When that didn't work, the nation threatened Brescia, the Italian city where Badu Chao's exhibition was being held. With warnings that continuing with the show would put any future collaborations in jeopardy, the city ignored the warning and the Italian government refused to shut the show down. Then the Chinese government moved to threaten Baidu Chao himself. They first ran propaganda pieces on Baidu Chao through state-run websites within the Great Chinese Firewall, casting into doubt his character and making baseless accusations against him. The government actively encouraged anti-Baidu Chao sentiment among Chinese social media while censoring any pro-Baidu Chao posts. Then things got personal. Chinese people began to show up at Baidu Chao's exhibit, claiming to be supporters. Getting close to the artists, they began to deliver warnings about how dangerous Italy could be. One even mentioned how people die on the streets here for no reason, in Italy, a clear death threat. Today, Baidu Chao is forced to live in Australia where he doesn't contact his family for fear the Chinese government will go after them instead. But if China has its way, soon nowhere will be safe to hide from the Chinese Communist Party, not even the United States of America. If you think this is far-fetched, consider China's response to the interruption of the 2022 Olympic Games torch lighting ceremony in Greece when pro-free Tibet protesters crashed the ceremony to demand accountability for the genocide of one million Uyghurs in China. After the event became public, those involved in the protest had their identities leaked online to receive thousands of death threats, mostly from Chinese social media users, ironically using a VPN to bypass Chinese sensors. This is hardly the first time that Beijing has used public outrage it creates to target its critics and even endanger lives. When the media team of University of New South Wales removed an article and tweet in which Elaine Pearson, the Australian director of Human Rights Watch, spoke about China's curtailing of human rights after the Hong Kong riots, pro-Chinese Communist Party students across Australia flooded the university's social media pages with hate messages. The irony here once more being that if they did this in their own country, they'd be jailed for it. But it's no laughing matter. As Australia Australia has a large Chinese population and there are now concerns over how to preserve free speech in the face of overwhelming Chinese intimidation of China's critics. If you thought the US, a country known for its staunch defense of free speech, is safe from Chinese influence, think again. In 2020, five people were arrested in what the US officials called an aggressive Chinese government operation to track down dissidents and critics of Beijing in the United States and repatriate them. This operation, codenamed Fox Hunt, was according to Beijing part of an anti-corruption campaign where the targets were supposed to be brought back home to China for trial. That is frankly terrifying, as it's clear China was willing to bring these critics who sought safety in America home no matter the cost, possibly even involving kidnapping. 
The scary thing is that by US officials' own administration, China has several of these squads in operation across the United States, and fighting and neutralizing them is now a top priority in order to protect the rights of Chinese immigrants in America. Chillingly, one of those agents caught by authorities had left a note on the door of one man they were seeking to bring back to China, which read, if you are willing to go back to mainland and spend 10 years in prison, your wife and children will be alright. That's the end of the matter. Would China seriously murder the family of a dissident on US soil? If the threat against Baidu Chao is to be believed, the answer is yes. And in a world where China is the top power, there is no room for free speech or criticism of the Chinese Communist Party. China's current president, Xi Jinping, took power in 2013, and since then he has worked to reshape China and eventually the world in his image. While the Chinese Communist Party was always a repressive authoritarian organization, under Xi the party has not only ramped up its authoritarianism, it started to export it to other countries. But more more on that later. Shortly after taking office, she undertook a massive anti-corruption campaign across both the Chinese government and the military. While China did in fact suffer from a massive corruption problem, ranking among the most corrupt in the developed world at the time, the truth is that Xi's purge wasn't just to root out criminal politicians and military leaders, it was to weed out anyone who might pose a challenge to his authority. It's no surprise then, as Xi sent back thousands to prison, he began to lay the groundwork for removing presidential term limits. In 2018, he accomplished that goal. When the Communist Party staffed almost completely with Xi loyalists voted to remove presidential term limits from the constitution. But ruling China isn't enough for the CCP. To ensure their own survival, they need to topple the liberal globe order modeled on Western democracies, and China's got two plans to do just that. The first is the most direct and simple approach, and it starts off right on their own shores. China's ambitions to become the world's reigning superpower will never come to pass if it can't first topple the current reigning world superpower, the United States of America. In order to achieve this, it first must kick the US out of the Pacific for good. Good. And that means building a strong navy. Navies need soldiers though, and to that end China is preparing its people and the world for war against the United States. Since the late 2010s, a slew of Chinese action films have been released globally, featuring Chinese heroes who inevitably end up fighting against corrupt American villains. Meanwhile, China threatens to blacklist any films that feature Chinese villains, as US producers discovered in 2012 when the Red Dawn remake was forced to undergo extensive reshoots and editing to change a plausible Chinese invasion of America into an unrealistic invasion by North Korean troops. China has never been able to challenge even just the US Navy's Pacific forces, never mind the entire might of the American Navy. But in the last 10 years, China's ability to challenge the US Navy has dramatically increased, with capabilities that it could only dream of when first Xi took power. First, China has developed a massive ballistic missile force, the largest in the world. So large, in fact, it's now officially its own branch of the Chinese military, the Chinese Liberation Army Rocket Force. The nation might still lag behind the United States when it comes to long-range targeting capabilities, but they have proven that they have the capability of hitting a mobile target far from their own shores, at least in testing. Under kinetic and electronic attack, it's not known how well the inexperienced Chinese military will actually perform. And that is key when considering discussing Chinese military military might. For all their improvements in modernizing their forces and expanding capabilities, China is still a completely inexperienced military which has not fought a modern war. The last conflict it fought against Vietnam in the 70s was a humiliating affair even after Vietnam had been severely weakened by its long war against the US. Vietnam ended up fighting the Chinese to a standstill, and though China claimed victory, it was Chinese troops who ended up being forced to retreat back over the border. A lack of experience in modern combined arms warfare is a serious deficiency in Chinese forces, and the nation didn't even have a joint command structure until only recently, meaning that its different branches of the military had no way of working together in a combat scenario. The US, for instance, has a long tradition of joint command operations, allowing it to seamlessly integrate its various branches into a unified fighting force. Another critical deficiency for China is a lack of realistic training for its combat troops, though this too has begun to slowly improve over time. For much of its modern history, China's military would only undertake exercises that were rehearsed in advance and designed to make the military look good, while providing little if any actual training benefit. Chinese missiles aim to level the playing field against the vastly more experienced and capable US military, which has a robust training schedule for both its active duty and reserves, and is one of the most experienced militaries in the world. A missile doesn't need to be trained, and a salvo of missiles can quickly level the playing field. Thus, the PLARF is a serious threat to the United States Navy. Their missiles have steadily become more accurate, with the DF-3A long-range ballistic missile initially having a miss radius of 4,000 meters, and today one of only a few hundred meters. That's far from pinpoint accuracy, but if you're using nuclear weapons or a large enough number of missiles, accuracy is largely irrelevant, even against a moving carrier strike group. 
and China definitely has the missiles to spare. With approximately 2,200 long-range conventional ballistic missiles ready to engage the US Navy all the way across the Pacific nearly to Hawaii, China has enough missiles to target every vessel in the US Pacific Command and overwhelm its anti-missile defenses. What's unknown, though, is how well the PLARF would operate in a contested environment against US kinetic, electronic, and cyber warfare assets. In order for a missile to strike its target, a long kill chain of assets must be protected from destruction or harassment. And the further away the target, the more vulnerable and critical this kill chain becomes. These kill chains can be aerial surveillance assets, satellites in space, ground and airborne radar, and all important data links, which must be protected from enemy attack and degradation. It's unknown how well China can defend its kill chains to ensure the rocket force can keep the US Navy out of the Pacific. But striking against its highest priority target doesn't require a very long kill chain. Thousands of China's missiles are aimed at the first stepping stone in China's ascension to dominate the world, Taiwan. This breakaway republic used to be a Chinese territory until after World War II, when the Nationalist Party retreated to the island from the Communists. Initially a dictatorship, Taiwan grew ties with the United States and changed to a liberal democracy. But that democracy is only 100 miles offshore from a communist dictatorship that very much wants it back in the fold. For China, reclaiming Taiwan is of critical importance. For starters, the continued independence of the island nation is a thorn in the side of the Chinese Communist Party. Its liberal democracy is a direct challenge to Xi Jinping's authoritarian dictatorship and sets an example that a growing number of young Chinese are eager to follow. This is a threat to the CCP's survival, as the last thing that the party wants is the Chinese people getting silly ideas like voting rights or free speech in their head. To counter Taiwan's influence, a robust censorship campaign targets and eliminates any pro-Taiwan or pro-democracy content on China's state-run social media. In China, this photo is illegal, and posting it can get you sent to jail. Mentioning the 1989 government slaughter of up to 4,000 student pro-democracy protesters in Tiananmen Square is a good way to end up in prison for years. The image and the history of the slaughter are censored across all forms of Chinese media. For years, China has promised Taiwan that it would still be allowed to rule itself after reunification. Under its vaunted One Nation, Two Systems program that was implemented in Hong Kong after the handover by the British to the Chinese, One Nation, Two Systems was supposed to ensure that the people of Hong Kong would continue to enjoy their democratic freedoms and independence for 50 years after the British handover. But just between 1997 and 2007, 218 cases of breaching the rights of Hong Kong citizens were verified. Today, Beijing barely tries to hide its influence over Hong Kong as it intimidates critics, infiltrates the Hong Kong government with politicians it buys and pays for, and even uses the local police forces against protesters who wish for democracy. In 2019, Xi Jinping once more offered Taiwan a one-country, two-systems deal if it reunified with China, which Taiwan immediately and completely rejected. Given how China has treated Hong Kong, it's difficult not to see why Taiwan's president so quickly and thoroughly dismissed any idea of being lured back into the Chinese fold with the lie of one-country, two-systems. Taiwan knows that once China has a foothold on its island, the democratic rights and freedoms it's enjoyed for generations are over. Taiwan's independence, however, is more than just a threat to the Chinese Communist Party's future. It's also a major military embarrassment for a country that wishes to be seen as a superpower. The definition of a superpower is a nation which can project its cultural, economic, and political and military power across the entire planet, a role that currently only the United States can fulfill. If China can't even bring an island nation of 100 miles off of its coast to a heel, how is it supposed to project its military or political Political power globally. As long as Taiwan remains independent, it'll prove to the world that China is incapable of projecting military or political power even just off its own shores, and thus Taiwan must fall if China is to rise. Whether it happens peacefully with reunification or under armed invasion remains to be seen, but recent polls showed that over 90% of Taiwanese supported continued independence. Retaking Taiwan, though, also gives the Chinese military the breathing room necessary to kick the United States out of the Pacific for good. From Taiwan, the Chinese Navy and Air Force both would have a strategic high ground in the Pacific, so to speak, from which to defend the Chinese coast. As long as Taiwan remains closely aligned with the United States, China can't break out of what's known as the First Island Chain, an invisible line that runs from Japan to Taiwan to the Philippines. Today, there's no chance Taiwan is going to reunite with China and the Chinese Navy can't pull off a cross-strait invasion of the island nation. But all that is changing, as the People's Liberation Navy slowly but steadily expands its inventory of amphibious assault ships and landing craft. In another few years' time, it's believed that China will have the necessary hardware to pull off a successful invasion, if they can keep the US air and naval power at bay. 
To that end, China has greatly expanded the size of its navy, with 355 ships, 145 of which are major surface combatants. It's now the numerically largest navy in the world, and many of its destroyers are more modern than aging US counterparts, though they don't pack as big of a punch with fewer missile cells per ship than the United States. Xi Jinping is dedicated to fully modernizing the Chinese military and fielding a world-class force by 2049, in time for the CCP's 100th anniversary, so the size and capabilities of the Chinese navy will only continue growing. To counter this threat, the United States has undertaken a renewed shipbuilding program and accelerated the procurement of new classes of destroyers, submarines, and even aircraft carriers. However, the US has commitments all over the world, while China can focus the entirety of its forces on just one opponent, the United States. This is a major strategic problem for America in a future showdown with China, but the US has one big advantage that China lacks – allies. So it turns out, authoritarianism is not a popular choice with most people, and acting like a regional bully isn't conducive to making friends. At the moment, China has no regional allies and few friends of any influence. Even its closest neighbors, for the moment, prefer to partner with the US than China. But this is where part two of China's plan to dominate the world comes to play – soft power. In order to push the United States out of the Pacific, China must wield enough economic and political power over its neighbors that it's able to force them under its influence and out of the US's. To that end, China has launched a multi-pronged defensive on its regional neighbors that includes charm, appeasement, political manipulation, and even outright economic coercion. Beijing's charm offensive has never worked out the way it hoped, and in fact ended up driving Australia even closer to the United States to the point that the nation has now joined a trilateral pact with the US and UK to defend the Pacific. When Australia joined the United States in calling out China for its human rights abuses and genocide of the Uyghur people, China responded by economically punishing Australia, putting harsh tariffs on Australian goods, and resorting to outright sanctions. In response to these actions, a Chinese official said, we'll not allow any country to reap benefits from doing business with China while groundlessly accusing and smearing China and undermining China's core interests based on ideology. The smear that insulted Beijing? Australia condemning the nation for photos like this, captured using a drone and smuggled out of the country, with a long history of chemically castrating Muslim minorities in its western provinces, separating families, imprisoning tens of thousands without a cause, and forcing Uyghur women to have abortions and undergo sterilization. China has rightly earned international condemnation for human rights abuses. The nation claims it's simply fighting extremism. The truth is, it's carrying out a quiet genocide and an estimated million are already dead. But while Australia didn't bow to China's pressure to remain quiet on its human rights abuses and tow the Chinese Communist Party line, other small nations have because they have no choice. For nearly a decade now, China has undertaken its Belt and Road Initiative. The modern Silk Road is meant to improve China's access to international markets by building infrastructure both at home and abroad. The biggest beneficiaries have been smaller, less developed nations whom have received loans from the Chinese government to build much-needed infrastructure with Chinese firms, of course. But the problems come when the loans come due, as these generous loans provided by China often have outrageous repayment terms that China knew the host nation would never be able to adhere to, despite the promise of greatly increased economic activity. In most of these places, that promised economic boon never came, and so nation after nation has defaulted on these loans. Unable to repay, the countries have been forced to cede entire airports, shipyards, and railways to the Chinese government, giving up ownership entirely. China's Belt and Road Initiative has thus been re-termed as modern colonialism, with China at the helm. But with most underdeveloped nations, the allure of Chinese economic prosperity will entice them to agree to just about anything Beijing offers, or commands of them. It's no surprise that many of these these nations suddenly find their government filled with pro-China yes-men and importing tens of millions of dollars of surveillance technology. Along with Chinese infrastructure, all too often comes Chinese style of government, and the Chinese Communist Party has been all too glad to export its form of authoritarianism to the world and how to maintain a modern surveillance state. With exports to over 60 nations, Huawei has become the global leader in exporting surveillance tech, with China even building entire surveillance networks for host countries. Slowly but surely, China is changing governments around the world and the US is inadvertently helping it. Under the Trump administration, the United States stepped back from its role as a global leader. This vacuum of power was quickly exploited by China, who was happy to infiltrate international economic and political organizations left reeling after a retreat from the United States. Due to ambiguity over the US's willingness to defend traditional Western values of liberal democracy and open markets, nations caught between a powerful authoritarian neighbor such as China and a desire for liberal freedoms found themselves questioning if it was politically survivable to continue to oppose the desires of their more powerful dictator next door. This was most obvious across the South Pacific, as nations such as Vietnam and Thailand were suddenly forced to consider the possibility that they may no longer count on US support 
to fend off Chinese political or military aggression. But the failure of the Trump administration to fill even basic State Department positions, hundreds of them, for over a year was another blunder that China was happy to exploit, sending its diplomats all over the world. With no American presence on the ground, nations even as close to home as Suriname and South America turned to Chinese interests. Now for the first time since the end of the 19th century, the United States faces growing influence of a major rival in its own backyard. If China gained a foothold in South America, it would be the first time since the 19th century that any rival power has had a presence in the Western Hemisphere. This is as intolerable to the United States today as it was in the 18th century when it removed Spain as the last European power with any influence in the US side of the world. This is a strategic victory for America that no other nation on Earth has ever enjoyed, as it allows the United States to maintain a forward presence with its military around the world, capable of quickly responding to aggression from any bad actor. If China gains a political and military foothold in South America, the United States will be forced to reel in some of its forces for homeland defense, severely weakening its place on the global stage. If the United States is to prevent China's ascension to global domination, it must once more take up the reins of a global leadership and cease its retreat from the world stage. Thankfully, while still too early to tell, it appears that a new American administration has dramatically changed course. However, China's growing economic influence is not something so easily countered. Even if African and Middle East nations are growing increasingly aware of the exploitative nature of the Belt and Road Initiative. The same can be said about China's growing military might, with Taiwan finding itself in the difficult position of resisting a growing giant on its doorstep while unsure if the United States will really defend it or not. And as the US continues to hesitate on the global stage, the rest of the world is starting to have to ask itself the same question. Is it better just to appease the Chinese Communist Party or run the risk of becoming its next victim? Not allies, but better than allies. This is how the Chinese describe their relationship with Russia. A statement meant to show mutual support and cooperation speaks far more about the divides between the two nations. The truth is, Russia and China have as much in common as they have in opposition, and it could spark a war. There are multiple points of contention in the China-Russia relationship. Both are autocratic dictatorships. Only China has at least given up the pretense of democracy. Both nations are seen as unfriendly to the current Western-led world order. Both nations suffer internationally for that. It would seem as if the two nations should be best friends, especially when their chief rivals are the United States of America and its extensive network of friends and allies. Yet differences that threaten war run deep, and if the two win at it, it might not end the way you think. Historically speaking, China has been the junior partner. After the triumph of communism in China post-World War II, the Soviet Union was quick to become a sponsor of the nation. However, ideological rifts soon led to outright border clashes, and just two decades later the BFFs were on the splits, with China cozying up to the United States of all places. The US-China relationship would soon turn adversarial, however, and China re-gravitated back toward the Soviet Union. By the time this happened, though, the Soviets were on the verge of collapse, and the balance of power between the two nations changed dramatically after the end of the Soviet Union. While the Soviets had been the far superior power during the Cold War, China's rapid modernization during the 90s, Russia's loss of much of their former Soviet territory and industrial and intellectual capacity led to a more even balance of power between the two countries. But Russia was always on the declining side of the scale, as its economic development focused on reactivating former Soviet capabilities while China was building brand new ones. Russia was annoyed at the fact that the former client state was now very much an equal partner, and as the balance of power continued to become more askew, with China's economy growing to over three and a half times the size of Russia's. A new ideological divide has sprung between the two nations, with the Russians resenting that it's now the junior partner and China reveling in their current superiority over the Russian nation. But there are very real material reasons for a decisive souring of relations between the two states. Russia has long resented the fact that the Russian Far East region is increasingly becoming, in the words of the Russian politicians, Chinese. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, there's been a major depopulation of the Russian Far East, made even worse by the fact that the new Russian state has failed to significantly increase infrastructure investments in the region. Illegal Chinese and Korean immigrants, meanwhile, have flocked to the region, along with a great number of very legal Chinese immigrants, alongside a lot of Chinese investment. The situation for Russia looks increasingly dire as Chinese firms pour money into the area, with the nation admitting that it has no other recourse but to accept the Chinese money. There's now a very real fear in the minds of Russian politicians that the Russian Far East will soon be lost to southern Asian powers like China. 
not necessarily militarily but economically, as foreign control over the region's developed energy supplies is growing year by year via investments. Culturally, the region is also starting to swing toward China as more and more immigration and investment comes from that nation. With such a weak government, military, and economic presence in the region, it's not outside the scope of imagination that in a few decades, the Russian Far East may push for independence and absorption by China. China clearly has a reason to manipulate events and ensure this happens, as the Russian Far East remains very resource-rich. For energy-hungry China, whose economy has only recently begun to slow down, securing energy supplies is of critical economic importance. But it's a necessity for an altogether different reason as well. China currently has a massive Achilles heel that ensures it will not be able to militarily challenge the United States. And that's the fact that it imports most of its oil via sea trade routes that the U.S. Navy can easily disrupt. Secure landlocked energy resources that the U.S. cannot interrupt frees up the Chinese Communist Party to more directly challenge the U.S., even militarily if need be. To this end, China has been fiercely competing with Russia for control over the energy resources of Central Asia, exerting massive influence and swinging smaller nations away from Russia. However, there is one final point of contention that is deeply souring the Sino-Russian relationship. For decades, China was a dependable and loyal client for the sale of Soviet and then Russian weapons. With no modern defense industry to speak of, China bought most of its equipment from Russia. However, as China has modernized, so too did its defense industry decreasing its reliance on foreign suppliers. But Chinese modernization has come at the expense of Russian trade secrets, with Chinese agents being caught red-handed multiple times stealing or attempting to steal classified Russian technology. China has also violated the tenets of some of its licensing agreements with Russia, especially regarding its fighter aircraft. Multiple Soviet and then Russian fighter designs were approved for license manufacture in China, on the condition that China still purchase Russian engines and electronics for those aircraft the two areas that China remains weak in. However, Chinese engineers began to reverse-engineer Russian components and build their own copies of Russian engines and avionics. This greatly angered Russia, however, the nation was so cash-strapped that it had no other option but to continue allowing licensing of its fighter designs. China's maturing defense sector, however, means it has little need to continue licensing Russian designs. This is most evident by the development of the J-20, which is inferior to U.S. fifth-generation aircraft but superior to Russia's own Su-57. To add insult to injury, Russia believes that China stole much of the technology that went into the J-20, driving an even deeper divide between the two nations. With egos, control over energy infrastructure and supplies, and increasing Russian desperation for recognition on the world stage, who would win if the two nations went to war? Since the end of the Cold War, Russia's military power has kept it firmly in the number two spot globally. However, estimates of Russian basic competency availability of equipment and effectiveness of their weapon system have proven to be severely overblown. Russia, it turns out, is utterly incapable of facing off against a modern military force and is best suited for minor conflicts against much weaker powers like Syrian rebels. Up against even a very small amount of NATO hardware, Russia has failed horribly in Ukraine, and the times it did go directly up against NATO weapons, its losses were catastrophic. Safe to say, Russia is no longer the world's second-best military. This leaves China as the world's second military power after the U.S., but the revelations about the Russian military has put China's own military power into serious doubt. China has historically struggled to clearly define its military doctrine. Despite being the far superior power, China was still militarily defeated by the much smaller and war-exhausted Vietnam in 1979. China claimed victory, yet failed to achieve its strategic objectives of preventing Vietnam from overthrowing Pol Pot from Cambodia leaving no question to who really won the conflict. A lot of Chinese military doctrine was based on Soviet doctrine, and this only began to change in 1991, as the United States absolutely trashed much more numerous Iraqi forces, themselves deeply entrenched in Soviet doctrine. Beijing went into a state of panic. In the first direct confrontation between U.S. and Soviet doctrine, the U.S. was not just proven the winner, but Soviet military doctrine was proven to be vastly inferior. U.S. doctrines of air-land battle and deep strikes using smaller number of more technologically sophisticated forces to sever lines of communication and disrupt enemy operations was so effective that in Moscow it was said that the only way to stop a U.S. offensive was with nuclear weapons. Russia failed to learn this historical lesson, but China was an eager student. However, modernizing warfighting doctrine is not something easy for a nation deeply entrenched in the old Soviet order and dealing with massive amounts of corruption. 
Today, China has attempted to emulate the U.S. combined arms operations within its own military, but while it's likely the superior emulator of U.S. tactics, there's serious questions of just how good it really is. For starters, China's corruption problem might be as deep and systemic as Russia's has proven to be, severely eroding China's warfighting capabilities. It wasn't until Xi Jinping's anti-corruption purges in the late 2010s that China took any meaningful steps toward correcting a rampant and out-of-control culture of corruption across its armed services. But as many observers have pointed out, these anti-corruption purges might have been just as much political tools to eliminate rivals as they were tools to make actual progress on changing Chinese military culture, leaving the efficacy of the purges and real Chinese competency in serious doubt. The problem may still be as systemic as Russia's. For generations, the Chinese military operated on a tradition of gifting, where junior officers gave gifts to their superiors in exchange for promotions. This places little value on actual experience and capability, putting incompetent officers in command. Another serious question to Chinese capabilities is the fact that China is yet to prove that it can actually carry out modern combat operations of high intensity. For years, China refused to send its troops on UN peacekeeping missions for fear of being embarrassed by their performance. Even more telling, however, is the fact that China only recently modernized its military with a joint operations command structure similar to America's, allowing for its various military services to more easily operate together in combat and allow for real combined arms warfare. As encouraging as this news may be, though, China has also a very long precedent of insufficient or very low quality training for its troops, with many of them being used for physical labor by their commanders in local infrastructure projects and training exercises being neither frequent nor realistic. To top it all off, it's important to remember that China has also never fought a modern conflict. So what would happen if the two powers went to war? If a war broke out between the two today, China would undoubtedly have the upper hand. Mongolia would become an unwitting avenue of attack for the Chinese forces, pushing into the very soft underbelly of the Russian central and far east districts. Historically, Russia has kept significant forces in the region to deter such an attack, but as the war in Ukraine drags on, men and equipment are being increasingly relocated to Ukraine. China, meanwhile, has no such commitments nor borders with potentially hostile nations, save for India. But the Chinese-Indian border is too mountainous for any serious land invasion to occur there. Chinese forces would be able to concentrate in the region, and with Mongolia largely doing whatever China tells it to, they'd have clear travel routes to the Russian border. The Russian Air Force would be integral in defending from a Chinese attack in the region, and here Russia does have a significant advantage. While the Chinese fighter fleet is more numerous at 1,200 aircraft versus Russia's 772, China still has a significant number of very old aircraft in its inventory, which would not fare well against Russia's one clear and decisive advantage, ground-based air defenses. Having prepared for decades to fight against the superior U.S. Air Force, Russia decided to not compete with the U.S. in the sky, but rather deny the sky to it by investing in air defense systems. Russia's S-300 and S-400 and now the S-500 are some of the best air defense systems in the world, even if they have trouble shooting slower HIMARS rockets down. With the air defense batteries already in the central and far east regions, Chinese air power would be seriously threatened if it tried to operate near the front lines, allowing Russia's air force to operate much more freely and directly threaten Chinese ground forces in a way China couldn't reciprocate. To add to China's difficulties, it would have to rapidly build up expeditionary airfields in Mongolia closer to the front lines due to its limited number of tanker aircraft and fighter aircraft capable of mid-air refueling. In terms of technology, the two militaries are likely at a healthy level of parity, but Russia is at a disadvantage due to the ongoing war in Ukraine and the effect of international sanctions. Predicting a victor and how such a war would play out becomes nearly impossible given that the extent of Russian corruption and incompetence on the battlefield so far makes it questionable if it would ever be able to confront a near peer to the US such as China. But while Russian deficiencies are in full display in Ukraine, China's own deficiencies are as well hidden today as Russia's were on February 23rd of 2022. One day before the invasion of Ukraine, Russia was believed to be a formidable and capable military power who would steamroll a much smaller nation armed almost exclusively with legacy Soviet-era equipment. China, likewise, is today believed to be a modern and capable power, who's considered to be a near-peer adversary to the US. There are many indicators that China's own incompetency is as well hidden as Russia's was. The United States, meanwhile, has proven in various modern conflicts that its forces are extremely capable even against significant threats. China has had no such opportunity. In all likelihood, a war between China and Russia today 
would devolve into a drag-down fight as both nations struggled to use modern doctrine alongside their high-tech weapons. The only conclusion we're comfortable making, however, is that in the case of war, the Chinese would likely neutralize Kamchatka and rout the Russian Navy. While China is still incapable of providing support for major naval operations far from home, Kamchatka is near enough to China and Russian defenses are light enough that the Chinese PLAN would likely emerge victorious. Once Kamchatka is secured, Chinese forces could begin a serious push for the Russian Far East, and while it's unlikely they would be able to threaten much of central Russia, the Far East region would likely fall to Chinese control and be annexed. With a great amount of energy resources there, even at a staggeringly high military cost, China would come out the winner. Here, we get to the crux of the problem as Russia would inevitably use nuclear weapons once its territorial integrity was threatened. Without its own nuclear retaliation, Chinese forces would be annihilated, meaning that in order for there to be any victor in a serious Sino-Russian war, nuclear weapons would have to be used. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine, most of the world's attention is on Eastern Europe and a potential confrontation between Russia and America. However, for those in the know, the real cause for concern is China's reaction to Russia's invasion. Rather than joining the world in condemning Russia, China has joined India in sidelining the seriousness of the invasion. Even worse, China now supports and helps spread Kremlin propaganda, suppressing the atrocities committed by Russia on Ukrainian civilians. Why is China so interested in helping Russia weather the global storm it unleashed? Because China has plans to launch its own invasion, and that puts it on a collision course with the United States of America. Not long ago, China's President Xi Jinping stated that China must reunite the breakaway island of Taiwan with the mainland. After World War II, Chinese nationalists continued their war against rebel communist forces, inevitably losing and being forced to flee the mainland for the island of Taiwan. In the years since, Taiwan has flourished into a vibrant democracy and a major global economy, but China refuses to acknowledge its independence and threatens military action and economic punishment against anyone who does. The problem with what would be an otherwise internal security matter for the Chinese is that the US has vowed to defend the fellow democracy against Chinese aggression. But why does China want Taiwan so bad? The reasons are numerous, but chief amongst them is because Taiwan represents a critical strategic vulnerability to China. Currently, China is hemmed in by what's known as the First Island Chain. This includes Taiwan, the Northern Philippines, Borneo, Japan, and the Ryukyu Islands. Originally, the United States used the First Island Chain as a strategy to hem in the Soviet Union and its allies during the Cold War and deny them access to the Pacific in case of a war. To that end, it established strong relationships with all First Island Chain nations in partnerships that continue to this day. Now the Cold War is over, but a new Cold War has dawned, and China is America's new rival. With pro-US forces all along the First Island Chain, China will never be able to be a true global power, as its navy is too vulnerable to attack. Taking Taiwan will break the island chain in two and give China an island fortress from which to project power deep into the Pacific. But Taiwan is itself a critical threat to China's continued existence, or at least its continued existence under the dictatorship of the Chinese Communist Party. As a democratic state, Taiwan is an example to all of China of a different, better way of life, and many young Chinese people who are being increasingly exposed to foreign culture are growing tired of the oppressive rule of the CCP. For them, Taiwan is a beacon of hope for what China could look like rather than the nation of strict censorship, government intimidation, and very limited freedom that exists today. Despite erecting the Great Firewall in order to try and limit China's access to uncentered information, the influence from outside of China still reaches many of the country's citizens. This is a dire threat to the CCP, and thus neutralizing Taiwan and bringing it into the fold is but one step into ensuring its own survival. Next, it must topple the United States as the head of the global order so it can export its brand of authoritarianism around the globe. If it can control global culture, it doesn't need to fear rebellion within its own borders. Taking Taiwan is a strategic necessity if China is going to be able to challenge the influence of the US. If China is going to rise as the dominant superpower or even just one that can compete with the United States, it must also be able to control the South Pacific. Currently, the United States Navy operates with impunity across the Pacific, and this puts critical Chinese trade routes in serious risk in case of war against the US. China imports the majority of its oil and relies on exports for much of its trade. If the US were to cut this lifeline off, China's economy would shrink significantly. Taking Taiwan and throwing the US out of the South Pacific 
thus ensures the safety and security of its trade, and removes the dagger the US currently holds to China's throat in case of a war. But how exactly is China going to take on the world's most powerful military? Is it truly capable of challenging the US? And what do the numbers say? China's strategy to dethrone the US is to dominate what has come to be called the Fourth Industrial Revolution. The first industrial revolution was the use of steam power to mechanize production, allowing for never-before-seen productivity and efficiency. Not long after came the second industrial revolution, heralded by cheap and abundant electricity, which allowed mass production on an epic scale. The third industrial revolution introduced advanced electronics and information technology to automate production, and now we're building on this revolution for what will become known as the fourth industrial revolution. This new revolution will be a digital revolution, with billions of people connected electronically and breakthroughs in artificial intelligence, robotics, 3D printing, quantum computing, and other fields. Much like the first factory to install a steam engine couldn't picture what the world would look like just 10 years from then, it's hard for us to predict what life will look like in the wake of the fourth industrial revolution, though it is going to be the most revolutionary change in the affairs of human history. However, China is picturing the fourth industrial revolution as the key to global hegemony, and it's investing billions into ensuring that it is the dominant power in the new world to come. China's strategy to dominate the world in the coming decades is a fusion of civilian and military application of technology. First, it's striving to be a leader in the technology department, ensuring that it is the first to create revolutionary technologies, thus enriching itself financially and creating dependency from the world on Chinese goods and services. Secondly, China is seeking to quickly turn new technological breakthroughs into usable military technologies that will allow it to surpass and dominate the US. China envisions future technologies as increasing the speed of future warfare, with future military success reliant on having forces that are mechanized, informatized, and intelligentized. According to the 2021 DoD's China Military Power Report, what this means is that China understands that victory is only possible with fully mechanized forces capable of being quickly moved into a conflict zone and supported with heavy firepower. However, those forces must also have access to a wealth of information via disseminated sensor systems, with this information shepherded through artificial intelligence that can give battlefield commanders exactly the information they need at the moment, while temporarily ignoring what they don't. Warfighters don't just need information, they need help sorting through it quickly, utilizing what's presently useful. If this sounds familiar to any of our viewers, it's because this is exactly the requirements the US military was investigating just a few years ago. China's Academy of Military Science has now established a mandate that the People's Liberation Army's warfighting theory and doctrine fully capitalize on disruptive technologies like AI and autonomous systems. Much like the US did in the first Cold War, China's focus is on building a modern state-of-the-art force. But today's force must be capable of accessing vast amounts of information and supported by AI that can execute automated tasks and assist with decision making. China wants to teach machines how to wage war, so they can advise commanders in the thick of battle. Currently, the Chinese military is not very well networked, but those capabilities are increasing every year. It was only a few years ago that China first established a combined arms operations capability by establishing joint chains of command between its services in the same style as the United States. Now it seeks to match the US's networked capabilities by 2027 and then exceed them shortly after. But why is networking so important? Well, for one, it's what makes the US military so immediately lethal to opponents. Having the ability to network together ground, sea, air, and space assets allows for the swift exchange of information and gives a fighting force incredible adaptability and initiative on the battlefield. For an example of what happens when a modern force is not networked, all one has to do is look at the terrible losses being suffered by the Russians against a nation of fraction their size and capability. In the 21st century, the Russian military is still fighting battles like it was World War II, and the Ukrainians are making them suffer for it. In order to become a global leader in defense technology, China is taking a page straight out of the US's book by pursuing a strategy of civil-military fusion. What made the United States the superior power during the first Cold War was the close partnership between its military and civilian industry, which thrived in an environment of innovation. Such a partnership allowed for a swift adaptation of civilian technological breakthroughs into military assets and vice versa. With the US military technology breakthroughs quickly adapted into civilian technologies, making US companies the most competitive in the world, artificial intelligence, robotics, quantum computing, and biotechnology will shape not just the future of warfare but of human society itself. Achieving technological superiority and leadership in one or more of these areas will make China a true competitor to the United States. 
Achieving hegemony over all these critical areas will make China an insurmountable superpower. In order to achieve the goal, China is investing heavily in domestic innovation, but also in foreign investment to acquire technology, the recruitment of global talent, academic collaboration for research and development, and finally, China's strong point, military and industrial espionage. So how is the US preparing for this looming confrontation? First, as scary as China's ascension may seem, it's important to remember that it's still running uphill against America. Since the end of the first Cold War, the United States has influenced a new global order based on growing liberal democratic values. As we've seen in the global backlash against Russia, the new world order frowns on the autocracies and abuses of the old world. Vladimir Putin is a relic of the old world with no place in modern society, and with a unified voice the West has shouted him and his nation down even going so far as to severely hurt themselves financially in order to punish Russian military aggression. This should be of grave concern to China's Xi Jinping and his Chinese Communist Party, as they too are relics of the old world. The uprisings in Hong Kong that lasted for months are but a taste of the simmering tension just under the surface of Chinese society, and proof to the CCP of the corrupting influence of liberal Western values. Should China follow in Russia's footsteps and engage the world in hostility, it too will quickly find itself a pariah and outcast nation, effectively crippling any bid to become a global leader. This is why it's important for China to undermine Western values. The United States remains the world leader in technological innovation, despite mounting pressure from China and beyond. But the US is far ahead in one important area of technology, its ability to rapidly commercialize new and emerging technology on global markets. While Chinese technology grows in influence around the world, American companies are already globally established brands. China's modern problem is in convincing the world to buy more than just cheap manufactured goods from it. US commercial success is also due to its global culture domination. American brands are present in every country on Earth, but so is its culture. With one of the most rapidly evolving cultures in the world, US culture can be hard to define or nail down, but cultural export instruments such as Hollywood and Silicon Valley remain unassailable by their Chinese counterparts. For instance, while China may have developed the massively popular TikTok app, it wasn't until China pushed the app on the American marketplace and established relationships with American influencers that the app exploded in popularity. This is important because military and economic might only count for so much and the US has used culture to bridge ideological gaps with partner nations around the world. Shared culture is the bedrock of strong strategic partnerships, and China has absolutely nothing of the like except for its partnership with North Korea. Shared culture and shared values are the reason the US remains the leader of the free world, and not because of its military being the strongest. Culture is another problem for China in its ongoing confrontation against the US and the rest of the West, because one of China's biggest problems is creating immigrant Chinese citizens. While over a million Chinese Americans reside in America, only a few thousand American Chinese have made their home in China. If China seeks to dominate future technologies by recruiting promising talent from around the world, it must be able to entice them, not just financially, but also with a desire to make China their new home. This is a massive problem for China versus the US, which remains one of the most attractive destinations for the world's most talented, due to not just economic opportunity, but its liberal democratic values. Finally, China must not just triumph over the US in future competition, but against the world, because outdoing the United States in one or more areas of technological innovation means little due to wide-reaching US alliances and partnerships. For America, a win by one of its allies is still a win for the US, while China must stand against the world completely alone. But how do the numbers stand today? What if a conflict broke out tomorrow between the two military heavyweights? Currently, the US is ranked as the world's number one military power, with China in the number three spot. However, this is debatable as given Russia's extremely poor performance in Ukraine, we expect that China will climb to the number two spot by next year. Dethroning Russia, whom it seems derives most of its power from its ability to threaten with nuclear weapons. However, poor Russian performance should deeply concern China, because just like Russia, the Chinese military is also completely untested against modern capable foes. While Russian forces were more than adequate to crush uprisings in Aleppo and Chechnya, Russian superiority in numbers with equipment meant very little when it went up against Ukraine's Western-trained military, with China's last war being in Vietnam in the 70s, a conflict it ended up losing, China should be extremely concerned about facing the United States in battle, whom, unlike China, is thoroughly tested in modern combat. Much like Russia, China has lacked a robust training regimen for its military, 
with exercises typically being highly scripted and mostly for the benefit of visiting dignitaries. This culture has begun to change within China, but the nation is yet to match the robust training schedule of the US military. Realistic training though is not enough for the Chinese military, as it, also like Russia, must also contend with a legacy of corruption that has plagued its ranks for decades. President Xi Jinping's massive anti-corruption effort has produced great results, but the service must still contend with many officers who hold rank due to the time-honored Chinese tradition of gifting, wherein a junior official gifts a senior official in exchange for promotion. Currently, the Chinese military numbers at 2 million strong, dwarfing the US military in its 1.39 million strong force. This gives China a numbers advantage, but the US retains a great deal of force multipliers that don't just even the playing field but tip it decisively in its favor. Chief amongst these is a well-trained and well-equipped modern fighting force, while Chinese units vary widely in modernity. A hefty investment in precision weaponry, integrated forces, and superior sensor and tracking technologies make the US a lethal adversary even against a numerically superior foe. Reserves will play a critical role in any Sino-American conflict, but both sides are nearly evenly matched, with China having 510,000 ready reservists versus the US's 442,000. American reservists receive continual training of one weekend a month and two weeks out of the year, while training for Chinese reservists is improving but still spotty. This provides the US with a smaller reservist pool, but one that is more quickly capable of being introduced into the fight, while Chinese reservists require longer training periods or risk being thrown into combat completely unprepared. The American defense budget dwarfs China's at $770 billion versus China's $250 billion, but that's not telling the whole story. First, the US budget includes many costs for operations that would have nothing to do in case of war with China, such as funding for its 11 unified combatant commands spread out across the world. These combatant commands are responsible for general peacekeeping, and their presence is a globally stabilizing force. Without them, local conflicts would quickly sprout and spiral out of control. For example, without US Central Command, Iran would quickly seek to neutralize regional adversaries such as Saudi Arabia, causing massive global disruption of oil and other trade that passes through the region. Also, China does not count all of its military investments within its published budget report, cleverly hiding them within other non-military budgets. A large part of its nuclear modernization initiative, for example, is coming from funds outside of its official military budget. Lastly, because Chinese military equipment is sourced locally, it pays less for goods than the US does for its own equipment. And that's because the standard of living is lower in China, with lower wages and less benefits, which means cheaper production costs. When compared by purchasing power parity, China's budget is significantly closer to the US's than a first glance would lead one to believe. Any war between the US and China would be waged at sea and air, making comparisons of the two sides' air forces and navies of utmost importance. The US operates an air fleet of 13,247 aircraft, easily dwarfing the Chinese air fleet of 3,285. When it comes to fighter aircraft, the two sides are close together, with the US having 1,957 fighters versus China's 1,200. American air mobility absolutely dwarfs Chinese mobility, though, with a transport fleet of 982 versus China's 286. Understandable given that the US faces conflicts far from its own shores, and China has little need to move its own forces significant distances. However, the massive advantage in airlift capability makes the US military much more flexible and agile than the Chinese military. Perhaps the most important distinction between the two air forces, though, is the number of special mission aircraft with the US operating 774 versus China's 114. The US has placed a premium on equipping aircraft for everything from early warning to electronic and signals intelligence and anti-submarine warfare. The US dwarfs China in special mission capabilities, and it's part of what makes the US Air Force and Navy so lethal. Unless a confrontation between the US and China takes place on Taiwan, attack helicopters won't figure into the equation. However, if they do, the US outnumbers China with 910 versus China's 281. Numbers only tell part of the story, though, because the weapon systems used by both sides only further skew the advantage to the US. For air superiority, the US fields the F-15 Eagle and F-18 Super Hornet. A fleet of 187 operational F-22s are unmatched by China, who has yet to field its own fifth-generation fighter in any significant numbers. Adding to China's problem is the US's Rapid Raptor program, which aims to bring a sizable contingent of F-22s to any battle space in the world within 24 hours. China's competitor versus the Raptor is the J-20, which is equipped with inferior engines versus American planes, requiring the use of canards on the body of the plane. 
These canards and other obvious engineering flaws have led to defense analysts to conclude the J-20 has at best only a slightly smaller radar cross-section than a traditional fourth-generation fighter. In fact, India claims it has frequently observed and tracked Chinese J-20s with long-range radar. The rest of the Chinese Air Force varies widely in modernity, with a significant part of its Air Force still flying Cold War Russian-made or Chinese-licensed relics. While China would initially put its most modern fighters such as the J-16, J-11s, and Su-30s into the fight first, once those have been downed, it will be increasingly reliant on older and older planes. Meanwhile, the United States doesn't just have a completely modern air fleet, but it's adding dozens of fifth-generation F-35s every year to its arsenal. The U.S. Air Force now has over 280 F-35s it can bring to the fight, with an additional 157 being added a year across the various services. In a war where air power would be decisive, the U.S. not only has the numbers advantage but also the technological advantage. At sea, the U.S. Navy is outnumbered by the Chinese Navy, with 484 vessels versus China's 777. However, there are numbers once again only telling part of the story. The U.S. operates 11 aircraft carriers versus China's two, and American aircraft carriers can bring over 800 aircraft into the fight versus China's grand total of 70. China's inflated naval numbers take into account things like missile boats, of which it has 84, while the U.S. only operates 10. In terms of tonnage, the U.S. Navy has over twice the hardware of the Chinese Navy, 4.6 million tons versus 2 million tons. A better way to compare the capabilities of the two fleets is to use a modern metric, battle force missiles. This is a count of the total number of missiles that a fleet has for use in combat before requiring resupply. This includes anti-ship missiles, land attack missiles, surface-to-air missiles, and torpedoes. Excluded from the count are short-range self-defense missiles like the USS Sea Ram. In 2019, the U.S. Navy had 11,834 Battle Force missiles versus China's 5,250. The gap is narrowing, but not significantly, with China adding 15 more Type 55 cruisers with 112 missile cells and 6 torpedo tubes each throughout the 2020s. That will increase total Battle Force missiles by 1,770, just over half of what the U.S. fields. Under the surface, China has the advantage with 71 submarines versus the U.S.'s 68. However, Chinese subs are mostly conventionally powered, while the U.S. subs are all nuclear. That makes U.S. submarines much more robust and able to operate for longer, but also decreases their vulnerability while operating. Chinese submarines are also an order of magnitude louder than U.S. subs, with their Jin-class ballistic missile submarines having an acoustic signature of around 120 decibels, while American Virginia-class submarines have an acoustic signature of 95 decibels, which is just 5 decibels over background ocean noise at an average of 90 decibels. Submarine warfare has always been a weakness of China, and it looks to continue being so for the foreseeable future. While the U.S. clearly has the naval advantage, it's important to remember that China can concentrate most of its fleet into a Pacific war against America, while the U.S. has naval commitments around the world. Even if it were to recall the bulk of its fleet for action in the Pacific, such an act would take from days to weeks to mature into a sizable transit of combat power into the theater. Realistically speaking, the U.S. Navy maintains an edge over China, but the two sides are very close to parity in terms of capabilities. Where the U.S. advantage comes is in its ability to quickly replenish combat losses with well-trained crews and modern ships, while Chinese combat losses are not so easily replaced. Further honing America's advantage over China is its partnership with regional powers such as Japan and Australia, who would either allow the U.S. to use their territory as bases of operation for war against China or very likely join the conflict itself. A new trilateral defense pact between the United Kingdom, the United States, and Australia is even seeing the U.S. building nuclear attack submarines for Australia on the condition that in case of war, it will join in the effort against the People's Liberation Army, Navy, and Air Force. America's advantage in equipment and technology is sizable and looks set to remain so, but it's the U.S. global partnerships and championing of liberal values that present the greatest likely insurmountable challenge for China. Until the Chinese Communist Party changes its core values, if it wishes to fight against America, it's picking a fight against most of the free world. In a recent press interview, President Joe Biden confirmed that United States men and women would fight to defend Taiwan from a Chinese invasion. This prompted immediate outrage from China, who claimed the U.S. was violating its own One China policy. In response, President Biden ordered U.S. and Canadian warships to sail through the Taiwan Strait. For decades, the U.S. operated under a strategic ambiguity in regards to Taiwan, never truly committing to its defense, but strongly hinting that it would oppose a Chinese invasion with military force of its own. 
This had served as a diplomatic lubricant between the US and China, as China sees reunification with Taiwan as a matter of not just national pride but of survival for the Chinese Communist Party. A free and independent Taiwan is a direct affront to Chinese attempts to become a global superpower, something it has yet to achieve. If the nation can't neutralize one renegade province right off its own shores, it'll never be able to be a credible global power. For the CCP, Taiwan's democracy is an existential threat on their own grip on Chinese power. Now, President Biden has said the quiet part out loud, and China can expect to face U.S. forces if it attempts to invade Taiwan. But just what would the U.S. do in case of an invasion? A Chinese invasion of Taiwan could only take place during the two- or three-week window in either spring or fall, when the tides are favorable. Chinese forces could also only land on a limited number of beaches suitable for the offloading of infantry and vehicles, and all of these are highly defended and booby-trapped in advance. Further, an invasion would take months to prepare, giving Taiwan ample warning and allowing its Navy time to mine the Taiwan Strait. It would be the most costly military operation in terms of life and resources since the great battles of World War II, and even without the U.S. aid, China is unlikely to succeed despite its overwhelming size advantage. Much like the Greeks at Thermopylae, Taiwan is in a strategically superior position that allows its smaller forces to fend off China's hordes. In case of war, the U.S. response would be by air and sea, and it's unlikely the U.S. ground forces would come into play at all in the fighting. However, it's not impossible that U.S. Marine and Army forces could be committed to the defense of the small island in small numbers to bolster Taiwan's defenders. The first thing that would happen in case of a war is American submarines would begin their deadly work of decimating Chinese vessels. Despite an increasing capability in anti-submarine warfare, China's ASW abilities are still lacking, and U.S. submarines are very good at remaining hidden. The American Silent Service would be tasked with ambushing Chinese vessels attempting to navigate the Taiwan Strait, striking with surgical precision at troop transports and support ships, which would be more valuable kills given their limited numbers than actual warships. If China can't move troops and equipment across the strait, it can't invade after all. The Taiwan Strait would be a perilous place for any vessel to operate in, and U.S. submarine losses would occur, but losses on the Chinese side would be significantly higher. Up north, just south of Russia's Kamchatka Peninsula, a single American Ohio-class submarine converted to carry cruise missiles would launch a devastating attack against the oil pipeline connecting China to Russia. This would leave China with only one route for oil to take over land into the nation, throttling down China's oil supply. Oil would be the key to victory, as any modern economy requires it to function. China, however, is extremely vulnerable to trade disruption. This is largely the reason that the U.S. has paid little heed to China's threats. Approximately 60% of China's trade, including oil, travels by the sea, and this is China's Achilles heel. The nation might have the world's largest navy, but largest doesn't mean most capable, and China's navy has some serious deficiencies. For starters, its numbers are greatly inflated by smaller missile boats, and it lacks the logistical or defensive capabilities to send its ships far from its own shores. This means that while China's navy could operate around Taiwan's territorial waters, sending them much farther out to sea than that would be a deadly mistake. This is a situation that China has tried to rectify by expanding its influence in the South China Sea via artificial islands. These man-made floating airfields are packed to the brim with long-range missiles and attack aircraft, but they simply can't do enough to protect China's overseas trade. That's because any ship bringing oil to China must pass through the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean, giving the United States two choke points to strangle China to death economically. Even before hostilities broke out, U.S. naval forces would be moving toward the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean. American warships stationed right outside the Gulf of Oman would act as a first line of denial to Chinese oil shipping. To the east, the Straits of Malacca would be cut off to Chinese ships by the U.S. Pacific Fleet. The end result is a near-total oil embargo on China that would leave it reliant on its own western overland pipes from Russia, which are, for the moment, out of reach of U.S. weapons. However, it's not unthinkable that in case of war, the U.S. wouldn't fly B-2 stealth bombers north through India to strike at these connections with standoff munitions. With very frosty relations between India and China, India is very likely to allow U.S. bombers to operate in its airspace for the mission. Even without striking these oil pipelines, though, China's oil imports would be reduced to a trickle, having immediate repercussions for its economy that would only worsen over time. If you've ever wondered why China hasn't actually invaded Taiwan yet, it's largely because the United States Navy has its foot on China's throat, and it would require minimal pressure to choke the country to death economically. 
U.S. carriers would doubtlessly join the fight in the skies over Taiwan. Although, to be honest, U.S. forces never need engage China, they simply carry out a blockade strategy. The only reason U.S. Air Forces would engage Chinese forces would be to carry out America's chief objectives in case of a war with China, the destruction of its air and naval forces so as to neutralize it as a future threat. Flying from airfields in South Korea and Japan, U.S. Air Force fighters could join the fight over Taiwan with the aid of aerial tankers, and operating out of aircraft carriers in the Pacific, U.S. Navy aviators would also be on the front lines against Chinese forces. However, American carriers would be under serious threat from Chinese ballistic missile attack, and that's why the U.S. Navy is working to greatly expand the combat radius of its fighters. The Navy's next-generation fighter, already in development, has a strict requirement of a combat range increase of up to 50% meaning the airframe will have to be significantly larger than the current F-18 Hornet or F-35. However, in the meantime, the Navy is also developing a fleet of drone tanker aircraft that can accompany fighters and top them off right before entering combat ranges. This would help put U.S. ships out of range of most but not all of China's long-range missiles. But it's at best a stopgap measure, as missile technology will continue to evolve, giving the weapons longer and longer ranges. Yet the U.S. remains confident it can operate its carriers in the Pacific in case of war. Fleet air defense vessels such as the Aegis cruisers can take on ballistic missiles with their complement of SM-3 missiles, which intercept ballistic missiles outside of Earth's atmosphere. To aid in their own defense, U.S. carriers are fast, very fast vessels for their size, with a publicly listed top speed of 35 miles per hour. However, it's a well-known fact that American supercarriers can move significantly faster than this when required, with a top speed that's classified. 35 miles an hour might not sound like much, but when you're targeting a vessel hundreds of miles from your launch site, this means that by the time your weapon nears the vessel's original coordinates, it's long gone. This is why modern long-range munitions require very robust surveillance, tracking, and targeting capabilities in the form of drones, AWACS aircraft, undersea sensors, and satellites, amongst others. Each of these assets forms one link in a long kill chain, where platforms feed targeting data to an incoming missile. While China has made great loops and bounds in its ability to hit U.S. ships at sea, it remains to be seen if China's kill chains can survive hostile contact with the U.S. forces. This by no means means U.S. supercarriers are safe, and the platform is likely an outdated concept that we should very strongly consider scrapping in favor of more, smaller carriers that leave the U.S. Navy less vulnerable to overwhelming losses from a single attack. Once American fighters are in the air, China will find itself facing the most advanced aerospace forces in the world. But this does not make U.S. planes invulnerable. In fact, China fields a longer-range air-to-air missile than the U.S. currently does, the PL-15. This missile has a slightly greater range than the American AIM-120D AMRAAM, giving Chinese fighters the advantage in a first-look, first-shoot confrontation. This is set to change in the next few years as the U.S. fields the AIM-260, which has a classified range but is believed to reach at least 186 miles, which is the range China's own next-generation missile, the PL-21, is expected to have. However, to actually hit U.S. fighters, China must detect them first, and this is why the U.S. spearhead will be its fleet of fifth-generation stealth aircraft. While not invisible to enemy radar, China's frontline fighters currently can't target American F-35s and F-22s until they're within approximately 35 miles, which eliminates China's slight edge in long-range air-to-air missiles. American fighters would be opening fire well before China's knew they were there. But stealth comes with a serious vulnerability, a lack of payload capacity. Flying in stealth configuration, a U.S. F-35 is limited to four AIM-120s and two Sidewinders. This does not bode well given the fact that China would be committing dozens of aircraft at a time to the fight. While U.S. stealth fighters would be able to knock out China's front fighter screens, it's unlikely they'd be able to penetrate deep enough to strike at Chinese bombers, launching devastating standoff attacks against Taiwanese targets. To do so, U.S. fighters would have to fly in murder configuration, fully loaded with missiles on wing pylons and thus destroying their stealth signature. China has its own stealth fighters for the U.S. to worry about. The Chengdu J-20 is an inferior fifth-generation fighter, the bottom of the pile when compared to the F-22, F-35, and Russia Su-57. It has decidedly non-stealthy features such as canards and engine outlets, and it's believed that it uses inferior radar absorbent materials in its construction. To boot, China operates only about 150 of these aircraft, meaning they're in limited supply. Yet even inferior stealth is still stealth, and Chinese J-20s would pose a serious threat to American air support assets, such as tankers and AWACS, both critical platforms badly needed for modern air campaigns. Armed with long-range PL-15s, J-20s could easily stay out of detection of American AWACS and fire their missiles, all but certainly bringing these valuable air assets down. 
To date, the US does not have a firm solution to this problem, which would be magnified by the fact that Chinese aircraft would be operating so close to home and thus within easy range of ground and naval-based air defenses. The battle in the sky over Taiwan would turn to one of attrition, which the US would inevitably win over time but not without taking significant losses of even its precious fifth-generation fighters. The sooner the American public accepts that the F-22 and F-35 are not invulnerable, the better position America will be to accept combat losses and continue to muster the will to fight because China would be looking to knock the US out of the fight not by military might but by eroding public support for the war. After 20 years of disastrous adventurism in the Middle East, the American people have little stomach for yet another protracted military campaign against a foe that isn't necessarily threatening them directly. It's China's hope that it can cut the knees out from under America by inflicting large losses and shocking the American people. Yet, defending Taiwan is of critical national defense importance to the United States. Allowing the island nation to fall to China would severely undermine U.S. dominance of the Pacific, as it would give China the ability to break what's known as the first island chain of containment. This is a chain of islands that hems China in from Japan down to the Philippines and has served as a barrier to Chinese naval expansion into the Pacific. Taiwan, however, is important to the U.S. and to the entire free world for another reason. Right now, the island nation supplies much of the world's supply of microchips and other computer components. Allowing this manufacturing capability to fall into the hands of the Chinese means that along with its own production capability, China would become the largest global supplier of these components critical to modern industry and militaries both. The Taiwanese embargo alone was a crippling blow to Russia's ability to manufacture new precision munitions. With China in control of the world's computer component manufacturing, it would effectively give the nation the ability to blackmail any other nation in the world and bully it into doing its bidding. This includes even the US. Do what China wants or else you get cut off from the critical supplies needed to keep your modern economy working. This is a strategic threat so great that even European powers have pledged some amount of support for Taiwan's continued independence. Luckily for Taiwan, though, the world's response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine has put a serious damper on China's ambition to conquer Taiwan. The unprecedented response from the West has shown China the lengths it's willing to go to in order to counter the aggression of authoritarian governments against free nations. Rumors swirl that China was actually planning to take military action this fall, but the Russian invasion of Ukraine completely derailed those plans. The last thing that China wants is to become a second global pariah, especially as its own economy faces some very serious internal disasters in the very near future. All eyes are on the Russian bear as it marches across Eastern Europe. But is the bigger threat to the world hiding in the East? Is China actually plotting to take over the world? As a president famously said, that depends on your definition of is. There's no question that China is a massive world power. In fact, depending on your standards, it might be only the second superpower in the world after the United States. It's the most populous country in the world, with over four times the population of the US. It has the second largest economy of the world, the third largest country in size behind Russia and Canada, and is one of only a small number of nuclear powers in the world. It's certainly the biggest power in Asia, and it might have much bigger ambitions than that. But what are China's actual plans for the world? To find that out, you can look close to home. The province of Hong Kong, which was a British territory for decades, was handed back to China in 1997 after negotiations which created a plan of one country, two systems. Hong Kong would be allowed to maintain its autonomy and run itself as a democracy, while China would administer certain larger affairs and it would officially be part of the larger country. That was the system for a while, until China decided it wasn't anymore, and the People's Republic of China has been tightening the screws ever since, and China has been through plenty of changes itself. Since China became a communist country in 1949 under Mao Zedong, it's been a dictatorship, but Mao's strict adherence to the communist dogma, which led to brutal famines and repression, have long since been replaced with a very different system under Deng Xiaoping and the current leader Xi Jinping. The country kept its autocratic system of government while replacing its economic policies with a sort of hybrid government-controlled capitalism. Under this system, China's economy has exploded and has become one of the world's largest producers of electronics, appliances, and mined rare earth minerals essential for manufacturing. But in other ways, China's modernization did not bring good things. While China is only loosely a communist country now, their security state is still very similar to what it was under Mao. 
only with a high-tech twist. In the modern age, governments use the internet heavily to gain intelligence on potential threats. That's true in China and in most other countries, with powerful tech companies turning over information to the government as needed. In China, websites like TikTok contain extensive tracking software that the Chinese government uses for unknown purposes. And internally, China has become notorious for its social credit system. This ranks citizens based on their perceived loyalty to the government and their conduct in other ways, with various privileges being granted only to those with higher social credit scores. And if you're under China's thumb, there is little you can do to escape. Hong Kong was given guarantees of a certain level of autonomy for a specific term, but in recent years those guarantees have been largely overrun. While they still have separate elections, Chinese authorities increasingly interfere in them and disqualify or arrest candidates who oppose the People's Republic's policies. This often leads to largely unopposed elections, and the recent COVID shutdowns led to China getting even more directly involved in shutting down protests and public gatherings. So, if you're inside China, you're probably kept under a pretty tight grip. But what if you're outside it? That depends on where you are. Because China has been involved in a territorial conflict near its borders for almost 70 years now. When the People's Republic of China took control, it was in the middle of a brutal civil war. The communists ultimately won, but the forces of the Republic of China managed to consolidate their forces on the island of Taiwan and hold it, essentially creating a new country there. The only problem is, China still refuses to recognize Taiwan as an independent country. In fact, while they claim they're the legitimate government of Taiwan, the Taiwanese government, now a democracy, still claims it's the rightful government of mainland China. But the People's Republic has much more power, and they've managed to use diplomatic pressure to prevent international recognition of Taiwan as a United Nations member state. And they're not afraid to punch back against big targets. China takes it as a personal offense when anyone recognizes Taiwan as being independent, even if that person isn't actually the head of a country. That's why most US politicians have avoided paying visits to Taiwan in the last few decades, to avoid causing any diplomatic crises for the president. But in 2022, Speaker Nancy Pelosi and some other members of Congress decided to make a visit to the island nation, and China responded hard. They stepped up military drills around the island, terrorizing the citizens, and one Chinese propagandist even said the country should shoot down Pelosi's plane. While clearly that would have started a hot war between China and the US, and cooler heads prevailed, it was clear China was willing to escalate in a hurry. But is China all talk and no action? That depends on where you look. While they get a lot of attention for their over-the-top online personality, with colorful propagandists spreading conspiracy theories and trying to meme, they actually do maintain a very strong deterrent against international criticism. And it's one Russia is fond of as well. China's justice system is notoriously harsh, with long sentences and the death penalty on the table for many crimes, far more than murder or treason. And while most of the people in Chinese prisons are Chinese, they have commonly arrested people from other countries for the purpose of prisoner exchanges. When the CEO of Chinese company Huawei was arrested in Canada, it wasn't long before a Canadian citizen was arrested in China on drug charges. But China's reach is growing fast. No one knows exactly what China's long-term plans are. The People's Republic has made many claims about invading Taiwan, and they're no doubt looking closely at Russia and Ukraine to see how that would go. But it's not going well for Russia. Most of the world has committed to supporting Ukraine with military and financial backing, and Russia has found itself increasingly isolated and sanctioned. While Taiwan isn't universally acknowledged as an independent country the same way Ukraine was, the United States has promised to defend it, so any sort of hot war on the island would likely escalate quickly with potential nuclear consequences. So China might be taking a slower, more global approach. China's internet efforts go far beyond an army of internet trolls, and they might just be becoming the world's most premier cyber hacking organization. While they're certainly not sharing the details of their operations, it's believed that they have three divisions of cyber warriors, specialized military forces that train in cyber attacks and work on behalf of the government, state workers who aren't in the military but are tasked with cyber warfare and spying, and a group of non-government workers who are likely hired by the government and have more deniability when they need to break into rival government's networks. And they've caused a lot of damage. Who has China hacked? Who haven't they hacked? Countless countries have claimed that Chinese hackers have taken classified data. Australia claimed that a 2013 attack accessed the blueprints of their intelligence headquarters, while Canada reported in 2011 an attack compromised multiple federal departments. Japan has reported at least 200 cyber attacks on Japanese companies and scientific institutes, while China's frequent rival India reported multiple denial of service attacks that may have come from agents of the Chinese government. Ukraine reported attacks during the opening days of the war. 
maybe China acting on behalf of Russia, and even the Vatican reported hacking attacks. The US has been the top target of Chinese cyber attacks for a long time, with reports of attacks on military, government, commercial, and industrial organizations. Even the largest companies in the world aren't safe. Google was hacked in 2010 and reported that the privacy of its users was compromised. They also went after massive companies like military contractor Northrop Grumman and manufacturing giant Dow Chemical. An attack on Yahoo might have had less implications for national security, but they probably got a good look at your mom's emails, including that extended exchange with a Nigerian prince. So what does China actually want with all this data? Well, if you ask them, they'd say, we don't know what you're talking about. No cyber hacking here, as they proceed to hack another company. And because China refuses to fess up to its cyber hacking efforts, it's hard to say what they're actually after. While they hack private companies, it might be Chinese-style capitalism at work, stealing trade secrets so they can give them to their own companies, allowing them to produce lower-cost remakes of major US products, giving them a leg up in the market. They may also be looking for key access to diplomatic cables in their hacking of government institutions. But cybersecurity experts worry about a much bigger threat. If China knows how to get into the mainframes of major companies and government institutions, then they might be looking for a way to turn them off. And if they were ever to initiate war over Taiwan or another country, being able to kneecap the US's military and civilian infrastructure at exactly the right moment could give them the edge they need to finish the job. But is China actually planning a big move? If they are, they've been putting their pieces on the board for a long time. China has a long reach in Asia that goes far beyond Taiwan and Hong Kong. They unilaterally claim sovereignty over the entire South China Sea, which puts them into conflict with Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, and other countries. China's claim means that they have the authority to stop intelligence-gathering activities by foreign militaries in the sea, which has led to multiple near-misses between Chinese aircraft and those of other countries. The Hague ruled in favor of the Philippines during a recent dispute, and China's response was to reiterate its claims and continue its campaign of harassment. So why does China want this territory so much? Some people think it's just maximalism. After all, if you claim the sea surrounding a bunch of countries, it's really not a big reach to then claim those countries. But the ocean itself is incredibly valuable, with an estimated 11 billion barrels of untapped oil and almost 200 trillion cubic feet of natural gas hiding far below the waves. If China manages to get the world to accept their authority over these islands, they would have a huge leg up in energy production, something they very much need with their massive population and energy needs. This area also has multiple highly sought-after fishing areas, which would give China the food it needs without having to rely on imports. And more importantly, they would control access to the food of many poorer countries who would have no choice but to align with them. And when you can't find a beachhead, why not make one? China has been known to take over small islands in the South China Sea, but they've started taking another approach, building artificial islands in the South China Sea that let them create unchallenged military staging grounds. These islands are typically built on rocks or reefs that are close to the surface of the water. After dredging the area to create a more solid floor, they're covered with harder material and turned into small military bases. This turns the disputed sea area into what's de facto Chinese territory, and serves as an act of intimidation against any other country that tries to set foot in the area. But is China a threat to the region? So far, China seems to be trying to win through soft power rather than open military action. They're hands down the biggest military power in the region, which means that any other country is likely to back down when directly challenged. While North Korea and India are also nuclear powers, North Korea is typically aligned with China, and India is preoccupied by its conflict with Pakistan. China's tensest relations in the region are with Vietnam, which it fought wars with previously. Now the two communist countries have hit rough waters, with China increasingly encroaching on Vietnam's coastline in the South China Sea while harassing Vietnamese ships. In 2014, China began building an oil rig deep within Vietnam's ocean territory. China seems to be making itself a regional power through sheer force of will, but elsewhere it's taking a very different approach. There's no continent more open to realignment than Africa, historically the subject of colonialism, occupation, and a brutal slave trade. Many of its nations only gained independence in the 20th century, often at the conclusion of bloody wars. Now, while many of the countries do have good diplomatic relations with Europe and North America, there are naturally old wounds to heal. And that's why China sees the continent as a massive opportunity for expansion, but this time they're not looking to intimidate their way into a seat at the table. They're looking to buy their way in. Chinese investments in Africa have gained a lot of attention in recent years as the country moves many of its manufacturing efforts there. Africa is far away from China's expansionist actions in the South China Sea, and as such, many African countries are neutral to China. 
So when a Chinese firm shows up looking to build a factory there, they're likely to be approved. And China knows how to sweeten the deal. They'll frequently build new housing or other infrastructure as part of their investment, creating potential loyalists down the line should the world divide between China and the US. And for China, investing in Africa just makes sense. Many people see Africa as the future of the world. Not only is the population of the region expected to double in the next 30 years, the highest growth of any continent, but seven of the world's ten fastest growing economies are located there. That makes Africa the world's best place for future investments, and China has made it clear that they're not just restoring the old dynamic of Africa being used as a looting ground for world powers, they frequently staff their companies with African workers, providing jobs to the local economy, although they tend to be low-skill and low-paid jobs, while Chinese figures hold the higher positions. But is this good or bad for Africa? Some worry that China is setting Africa up for what's called a debt trap, where they invest heavily in a country in exchange for promises of repayment of the investment, only for the profits to never come and the country to be stuck in a state of limbo. That hasn't happened so far, as it doesn't seem like China simply wants to extract resources or money from Africa, they view it as a diplomatic investment as well. China wants to control the tech infrastructure in these countries, bringing industry to many of them for the first time. If China was to go to war with the United States and NATO, those countries would find themselves potentially cut off from a massive infrastructure network as China had commandeered it. One of the biggest concerns about this effort is that the heavy industrialization in African countries is hurting their environment, but the governments in most countries seem excited for the investment. But is there a longer plan at work here? China seems to have a hand in just about every region, similar to the other superpowers of the past and present. For Europe and North America, they mostly have cautious diplomacy and an aggressive cyber hacking strategy to gain intelligence. For the neighbors in Asia, they approach with belligerence and flex their muscles to claim territory. But for nations in the so-called third world, there's often an outstretched hand instead, offering heavy investments and possibly an alliance against the older powerhouses of the world. And some think this might be all coming together for China to make a big move. Many people have said the 21st century could be a Chinese century with the country's economy growing by leaps and bounds, but they've been hit hard by their efforts to contain the COVID-19 pandemic, leading to economic slowdowns. Additionally, they've lost many diplomatic allies in the West due to their aggressive military tactics and their domestic policies, particularly their internment of the massive Uyghur Muslim population and their treatment of other minority groups like Buddhists and the Falun Gong movement. That's kept their growth in check, with many Western countries becoming more hesitant to invest heavily there. Which then leads people to worry, are they biding their time for a military move? China is incredibly powerful militarily, maybe the second strongest military in the world. While Russia has the most nuclear weapons of any country, its weapons are old and unreliable to the point where no one knows how many would even fire. China is estimated to have only 350 nuclear weapons, a far smaller arsenal than the US, but every single one of them is in working order, and many are attached to powerful missiles that could hit just about anywhere in the world. They're also one of only a few countries to have aircraft carriers, and their naval and aerial fleets are believed to be competitive with the US's fleet. But their biggest weapon might be how prepared they are. So if China was planning to actually take over the world, how would they go about it? The first step would likely to be to plan with some other countries. China has become one of Russia's few remaining allies since the war with Ukraine, helping them get around sanctions and providing vital economic help. So if China wanted to make its own move on Taiwan, or a much bigger plan, it would likely pull in Russia for help. A coordinated attack on several targets might be much harder to coordinate, and they might have a third partner as well, North Korea, run by the infamous Kim Jong-un. Like China and Taiwan, North Korea has never accepted the independence of South Korea, even after 70 years. A three-pronged attack like this might take the world by surprise. But would they actually win? In terms of a full military invasion, we've seen how Russia has performed and North Korea has never been tested against a military outside its peninsula. But China's naval fleet is fearsome, and many believe it could fight the US fleet to a standstill in the Pacific. And when you have two nuclear powers standing off shooting at each other, there's always the risk of escalation. China could not win a nuclear war with the US, but a major nuclear exchange would likely mean neither country is left standing. So China is hoping to avoid nuclear war, and it might have a plan to do so. Could China win a war without firing a shot? This might be where China's cyber hacking infrastructure comes into play. Unlike other military attacks, hackers don't announce themselves. They sneak in under the cover of darkness. Imagine if one morning America woke up and nothing was working. The internet was down, smart devices were malfunctioning, and even the government's connections weren't working. They spend hours getting things up and running, and tune into the news to find out that Chinese warships are shelling Taiwan. 
Their military has established beachheads in Vietnam and the Philippines, and North Korea has crossed the DMZ. While the fighting is far from over, China has declared their invasion successful and says that any interference from the US would be an invasion of their territory. Surely the United States would arm up, right? Not so fast. Maybe China calls in its chips with Africa and cuts the US off from several key suppliers. Supply chain issues are a bane of Russia in the Ukraine war, and the United States might now face the same problem. China would have cut off its supplies, as will any country aligned with it. More critical and occupied Taiwan would no longer provide America with the key semiconductors it needs to operate much of its technology, and the United States would have to think twice before expanding key military technology. While South Korea's fearsome military would likely be able to hold off North Korea for a long time, and China would likely rein in the North to keep them from using nuclear weapons, it's unlikely that Taiwan or Southeast Asian nations could hold out too long without support. But is this where China would want to stop? Taking over much of Asia has been China's goal for a long time, and if this plan would work, it would have pulled it off without getting bogged down in a global conflict. This would firmly entrench it as a superpower and make the United States look toothless. More countries would be looking to align with China, and that includes India. China's goal would likely to be to turn India into a regional client state rather than actively trying to conquer it, and with Pakistan on one side and China on the other, they could put a lot of pressure on the subcontinent. Smaller nations in the region would likely choose to align with China for protection, and China's next big step would be to expand further out into the Pacific. Many small island nations there could be pressured into signing deals, giving the Chinese free reign in exchange for protection, and that might bring China into direct conflict with the United States. While most Pacific islands are independent nations by now, the United States has several territories including Guam and American Samoa. While they're unlikely to try to annex any of them outright, at least at this stage, they would likely start treating them in a similar way to the way they did Vietnam initially. They would just step on their sovereignty as much as they want and dare them to respond. Would the United States tolerate this? That depends on the political climate at the time. How much hunger does the US have for a conflict with a rival superpower? Does the public agree with defending these islands, or do they leave them to their fate? If they're left to their fate, that's another blow against the United States' standing in the world. And the next on the chopping block is Hawaii, an actual state but located thousands of miles away from the mainland. With a strong independence movement, could China make inroads there? So China's plan may not be to conquer the world in a shock and awe military campaign against the most powerful armies in the world, it might simply be planning to expand its power and influence piece by piece until it stands alone as the most powerful superpower in the world. You're sipping on a cup of steaming coffee in mission control of the China National Space Administration. The room is covered from wall to wall with glowing screens and monitors. You lean back in your chair and gaze through the wisps of haze rising from your mug. All is quiet as you're about to shut down the U-22 rover for its daily recharge. Suddenly, a scientist bursts through the doors, his hair disheveled. His eyes are as large as full moons. You won't believe this, he pants. We found something. You stand up and rush over to the scientist. You eagerly urge him to go on, but he has to catch his breath. The scientist finally stands up and sputters, we, we found something strange on the dark side of the moon. You take a step back and ask him to repeat himself. The scientist said, I was going through the videos from U-22 and it picked up something strange, something that we can't explain. A million thoughts race through your head. What could the mysterious object be? You need more information, but you can't help the feeling of butterflies in your stomach as you think, could we have found life? Aliens? A crashed UFO? What is it? You ask as you shake the scientist. We just don't know. It looks to be a gel-like substance. It's in one of the craters the rover was exploring. There shouldn't be any gel on the moon. There's no atmosphere and it's freezing cold, he responds. A gel-like substance, you think? How could there possibly be a gel-like substance on the moon? You run over to the red telephone on your desk and pick it up. There are no buttons to push. Once the phone is removed from the cradle, it automatically dials the head of the China National Space Administration. The line picks up and you speak into the receiver. Sir, we found something. I think you should bring everyone in. This could be big. As you wait for your boss and the rest of the team to come in, you think back to December 7, 2018, when the China National Space Administration launched Chang'e 4. The main goal of the mission was to land on the dark side of the moon and collect data. On January 3, 2019, China became the first country to successfully land a spacecraft on the far side of the moon. You smile as you recall that this was no small feat. Several other countries had tried and failed to do what your team accomplished. Landing on the dark side of the moon is difficult because of the inability to maintain constant communication with the spacecraft. The monstrous sphere that is the moon blocks the signals between Earth and any vessel on the other side. 
To get around the problem, you and your team placed a satellite between the moon and the Earth. The satellite is at an angle which allows you to maintain communication with Chang'e 4 at all times. Once the spacecraft successfully touched down, the U-22 rover drove off the lowered landing platform and cruised across the ancient moon dust. U-22 is the only rover that has ever explored the dark side of the moon. It's an exciting time for all astronomers and astrogeologists. U-22 will collect data that may uncover the mysteries of the moon's early history. You're brought out of your reminiscing when the entire team that's working on Chang'e 4's lunar project floods into mission control. The head of the China National Space Administration walks over to your terminal and says, show me what you found. You replay the video from U-22 showing the rover pulling up to the odd gel-like substance. It seems to shimmer like diamonds. It's day 9 of the mission and you've been up for 24 hours straight, trying to unravel the mystery of what the U-22 rover has uncovered. After the scientists brought this strange object to your attention, you postpone all other driving plans for the foreseeable future, or at least until you can figure out what the heck it is you're looking at. The video footage is delayed by a couple seconds from the vast distance the signal has to travel. You have to program the rover to return to the position where it came across the gel-like substance. With the help of obstacle avoidance cameras, you maneuver the U-22 rover back toward the edge of the crater where the mysterious substance is located. You target the spot where the substance rests. The rover slowly pulls up and comes to a stop. You focus the camera on the gel-like substance. Everyone is holding their breath in anticipation. You cycle through different settings in the tools of the U-2 camera. You examine the substance in the visible light spectrum and then in the near-infrared spectrum. This detects light that scatters and reflects off the strange material. The collected information will help you identify the chemical makeup of the discovery. The data is surprising. You scratch your head as your team tries to identify the substance and understand how it ended up on the moon. One thing that stands out is that the mysterious substance has a unique color. It shimmers like melted glass and has a metallic sheen to it. The object resembles volcanic rock like obsidian on planet Earth. The moon does not have any active volcanoes and its core has been dead for millennia. Therefore, it would seem that the substance was not created by cooling magma or other volcanic activity. So what is it then? What could create such a unique substance on the far side of the moon? You and your team of scientists come to the conclusion that at some point a meteor flying hundreds of thousands of miles per hour slammed into the moon's surface. The moon does not have an atmosphere like Earth, so there's nothing to slow the impact of the meteor. There's no protective shield that causes space rocks to burn up on entry and create shooting stars like we see on our planet. The meteor rockets toward the lunar surface without anything to slow it down. The crust of the moon takes the full impact of the space rock. This releases an enormous amount of energy. It's analogous to a nuclear bomb detonating. On Earth, when nuclear weapons are tested, the rocks and sand in the area become superheated and create a glassy mineral called trinitite. The same process happens when meteors impact the moon's surface at high velocities. You and your team conclude that this must be what happened on the far side of the moon to create the unknown substance. The landscape is pocked with meteor impact craters. The lunar surface has been battered for billions of years by the unrelenting rocks hurling through space. It's too early to say with 100% certainty, but the gel-like substance you found is most likely not gel at all. Instead, it's probably similar to the rock formation that astronauts brought back to Earth during the Apollo 17 mission. After that mission, scientists who analyzed the glassy rocks from the near side of the moon concluded that their chemical makeup was consistent with a meteor strike. High-velocity meteor impacts release huge amounts of pressure and heat on minerals they slam into. This compression and superheating causes the chemical structures of regular rocks to shatter. Then, as they cool, the molten minerals reform into a structure that looks like shiny glass and bends light in surprising ways. Something that you and your team note is that this rare mineral may be abundant on the moon. Who knows what new technology and inventions could come from your discovery? You know that the properties of the mystery substance must be studied further. You've made an incredible discovery just eight days into your mission for the China National Space Administration, but it's time to carry on. The moon holds many unexplained mysteries and opportunities for research. One of the most surprising discoveries you want to investigate further came from Apollo 17, when astronaut and geologist Harrison Schmidt discovered orange-colored soil near the spacecraft's landing site. It would seem that the moon has a knack for creating rocks and soil of interesting colors. The discovery was baffling at the time. Scientists concluded that the orange mystery soil was created during a volcanic eruption 3.64 billion years ago. Although the moon has not been volcanically active for billions of years, in the distant past the surface of the moon was covered with volcanoes. The time during the moon's formation was full of intense seismic activity. 
Its core was still molten and magma spewed out of numerous volcanoes across the lunar surface. You're hoping to gather more data on the moon's early volcanic activity during your mission. A different mystery your team may help solve was announced recently by NASA. This mystery has to do with the side of the moon where the U-22 rover was located. NASA recently found a massive blob of unknown makeup underneath the surface of the far side of the moon. This mystery blob has a mass relative to five piles of metal the size of the Big Island of Hawaii. The blob sits at least 180 miles beneath the South Pole Aitken Basin. The South Pole Aitken Basin is a colossal crater that was created billions of years ago. It was most likely formed when the moon's molten surface was beginning to cool. Before the surface could harden, an asteroid slammed into the crust, creating an enormous indented crater. But what lies below the surface? What is the huge blob? Maybe you and your team at the China National Space Administration can find out, since you are the only ones who have a rover on the far side of the moon. You and your team have already accomplished an astonishing amount in the short time the Chang'e 4 mission has been active. You use reflected radiation to analyze the minerals and composition of the moon's surface where the rover landed. The analysis of the landing site reveals two mineral types that are not a match for any of the known minerals in the moon's crust. Maybe these minerals came from the much sought after lunar mantle. Scientists have been working for years to identify the makeup of the moon's mantle to understand its formation and the inner layers better. If you and your team can understand the moon's evolution, you can uncover the mysteries of the moon's magnetism. Did the moon have a magnetic field similar to ours in the past? How strong was the magnetic field? Which way was north? All of these questions could be answered by you and your team. The Shang'e 4 mission has relayed information about the lunar dust layer. The moon's dust is called regolith, and your team has discovered that it's thicker than previously thought. The spacecraft your team sent to the far side of the moon has measured the regolith at 39 feet deep. In the past, the dust caused problems to manned missions through clogging vents and reducing visibility. The dust itself came from pulverized rocks that settled on the lunar surface after billions of years of asteroid bombardment. You and your team have confirmed that this dust exists on the far side of the moon and any future missions need to take into the account the danger it poses. Your team along with other scientists and astronauts have dreamed of creating a lunar base, a place where astronauts and researchers can go to conduct experiments. It could also be a port or a building facility for spacecraft that will venture further into the solar system. The moon base could serve as the first stop on manned missions to Mars, Venus, or beyond. You now think about how the data collected by Chang'e 4 could be used to make the moon base a reality. You envision sending more rovers to clear the dust where the habitat could be built. Mining and drilling robots could be sent to harvest moon rocks and resources to construct the moon base. Perhaps the discovery U-22 made of the mysterious substance will end up being used in future technologies. Your analysis of the minerals on the surface of the dark side of the moon may reveal that it's an ideal location to set up a refueling station. Or maybe later in your mission you find that there's ice or water laying just below the surface of the moon, the most precious resource in all the galaxy. All of these dreams may be possible one day because of the success of the Chang'e 4 mission. The mysterious substance you found still needs further analysis, but it may contain materials that could further space exploration. The data that the China National Space Administration is still collecting from its mission to the far side of the moon may unlock the mysteries of the largest and brightest object in our night sky. The United States, the world's premier military power. China, a rising power that may one day be able to challenge the US's own, but today cannot. What if these two military giants went head to head though and the conflict played out on China's own shores? What if the United States decided it needed to invade China? Could China defend from a US invasion? First though, is conflict between the two even probable? The short answer is yes, and the possibility is frighteningly real and seemingly only growing more realistic by the day. Today, these two great powers find themselves locked in what historians have come to term Thucydides' trap. Thucydides was an ancient Greek historian who commented on the rise of Athens and the fall of Sparta. For a long time, Sparta was the reigning power of the Greek world, until the city-state of Athens began to rival it in terms of economy, wealth, and military power. The end result was an inevitable war between the two city-states and their allies, as one side, Sparta, sought to hold on to its spot as the number one power and Athens sought to dislodge it. If you think that's ancient history, then consider that out of 16 instances in just the last 500 years alone of a rising power supplanting a pre-existing power, war broke out 12 out of 16 times. Clearly, the odds are not good that the US and China can avoid war. 
To make matters worse, the seeds of conflict between the two nations already exist in a variety of potential flashpoints. The biggest of these are Taiwan's continued independence and China's aggressive and illegal expansion into the South Pacific. Eventually, most likely due to the matter of Taiwan, a conflict between the US and China is likely, especially if China wants to prove it really is a great power. As long as the US Navy reigns supreme in the South Pacific, China cannot claim to be a great power and cannot influence its neighbors the way it wishes to. For China, conflict with the US is all but inevitable, not just a matter of national pride, but one of continued political survival for a communist party that finds itself increasingly isolated from the outside world by growing democratic movements along its borders. So what if the worst came to worse? Could the US successfully invade China? The US's greatest asset is the presence of its forces all around the world thanks to defense agreements with partners and allies. This is a mutually beneficial agreement as it provides a boost to the hosting nation's economy and ensures its continued defense in the case of a war. For the US, though, it has the added benefit of allowing it to stage forces all around the world and quickly react to a conflict. American forces with their wide network of military installations and partnerships with nations all over the globe allow them a degree of flexibility and mobility that no other nation can even come close to matching. In a war against China, the US would rely on its Pacific bases to prosecute the conflict. Spurred on by China's growing aggressiveness against its neighbors in the South Pacific, President Obama launched a strategy of encirclement, much like that employed so successfully against the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Today, this means that US forces are deployed or can deploy from bases in Japan, the Philippines, Guam, South Korea, Singapore, Australia, and even Thailand. Plotted on a map, this clearly shows how American military power is posed to contain China no matter in which direction it attempts to move its own military. The reverse is also true. The wide dispersion of US power in the South Pacific allows it to use military force against China from multiple avenues of approach forcing Chinese defenses to spread out amongst a host of potential threat vectors. However, the primary purpose of US encirclement is not to start hostilities, but rather to respond to them or prevent them altogether. China's chief strategic problem is that it relies on overseas routes for most of its trade, with up to 60% of all Chinese trade passing through the South Pacific. Current US force predisposition has the foot in the US military poised straight on the jugular of Chinese trade, and it would not take much pressure to shut that trade off and send China into an economic collapse. In case of war, this is exactly what would happen. US forces would immediately begin a naval and air blockade of all Chinese trade, boxing in the Chinese Navy all the way from the Malacca Straits to the Sea of Japan. While the Chinese Navy now for the first time in history outnumbers the US's own navy, it largely lacks a capability to operate far from its own shores and is best suited for coastal defense. This would make it impossible for China to send a naval expeditionary force to the Malacca Straits and secure them for its trade ships. Then there's the added complication of US allies and partners in the area who would indubitably join the US side in the conflict. Chinese ships trying to leave their territorial waters would find themselves threatened on all sides on top of having to deal with the formidable American Pacific Fleet. At the same time that the US ships are blocking off Chinese trade though, the People's Liberation Army rocket force would saturate US bases in Guam, South Korea, Japan, and possibly even the Philippines. These attacks would overwhelm American missile defenses and cause considerable damage, requiring weeks of repair to bring them back into operational status. This huge missile volley would greatly delay US offensive operations by both its air and naval fleets, not to mention the preparation of any sort of invasion force. However, it would also greatly anger the nations that host US forces, as missiles like the DF-21 ballistic missile have a margin of error that can be as much as several hundred meters. Missiles would be destroying not just US forces but also Japanese, South Korean, and Filipino military assets and even civilians. This would further cement support for US action against China. The Chinese missile stockpile numbers in the thousands, but it is ultimately finite and military facilities can always be repaired faster than missile stockpile can be replenished. Not to mention that long before a second volley can be fired, US forces would have moved to heavily damage China's command and control assets. In the opening of the war, American stealth bombers would strike at Chinese long-range surveillance radar, command and control nodes, and precision military systems deep inside the country. These attacks would be mirrored by a missile barrage nearly as large as China's own being launched by America's large submarine fleet. 
most of which are capable of carrying long-range land attack cruise missiles. While China may be able to hold the US surface navy at bay with its rocket forces for a few weeks, possibly even a few months, the US submarine force would be impossible to target with those same rocket forces. And given China's extreme lack of anti-submarine warfare assets, the American silent service would all but have the run of China's coast. American stealth aircraft and submarine forces would continue striking deep into China, destroying air defense networks, satellite communication nodes, and other vital facilities for coordinating China's ability to threaten the American Navy. U.S. stealth bomber losses would no doubt be very high, potentially knocking the entire fleet of 20 U.S. B-2 bombers out of commission within the first few weeks. Air attacks would then have to rely on unmanned drones supplemented by submarine cruise missile strikes, but eventually Chinese defenses would be eroded enough to allow B-1 and even B-52 strategic bombers to begin to soften up Chinese coastal defenses. Going any further inland would likely be fatal for B-1 and B-52s, even at this stage of the war, with the Chinese Air Force suppressed but very much still capable. Escorting those non-stealthy bombers, however, would be American F-22 Raptors and F-35s, which would operate from repaired facilities in Japan and South Korea. While the US would suffer losses to both its F-22 and F-35 fleets, the loss ratio would be extremely favorable. After a few weeks of air operations, enough of China's air defenses and most of its formidable fighter aircraft would have been thinned out to allow non-stealthy US Air Force F-15s and Navy F-18s to join the fight considerably boosting the presence of American combat aircraft. American air forces are not just more capable than China's but considerably larger as well, with 13,264 total aircraft versus China's 3,210. Of those aircraft, the US operates nearly double as many combat aircraft as China, at 2,085 versus 1,232. To make matters worse for China, US aircraft are overwhelmingly more modern and capable, and its pilots more experienced. China may have the home field advantage, but the US would dominate the air and sea war within a few months, putting a stranglehold on China economically. In the real world, this is the limit of the US's plans for a war with China. Destroy its navy and air force and strangle it economically into submission. In today's scenario though, we're taking this a step further. Preparation for an invasion of China would take many months and require the mustering of most of the US's amphibious forces. If the US wanted to gather an invasion force and maintain its global commitments as they stand today, it would need to institute a national draft, which could potentially see it add up to 145 million additional personnel to its military. However, China's 1.3 billion strong population could muster up a defensive force of 753 million. Though with its much smaller military budget, a floundering economy due to the US's stranglehold on its trade, and damage on its infrastructure caused by American air and naval attacks, China would only realistically be able to train up and equip a small percentage of this number. Likewise, the US would only be able to equip a small percentage of its own reservists, leaving the numbers advantage firmly in Chinese hands. The US has always had the capability to move forces around in large numbers relatively fast, but in recent years it's greatly increased its expeditionary capabilities, adding a number of mobile landing platforms, afloat forward staging bases, and amphibious assault ships. Today, the US maintains three marine expeditionary forces, its primary force dedicated to kicking down the door on hostile beaches all over the world. Each force can bring to an enemy's shore between 20,000 and 90,000 marines and sailors. These would quickly be supplemented by US Army expeditionary forces, though they would require longer to assemble, prepare, and transport to a hostile Chinese beach. Initially, the American Marines would be forced to hold the beach alone, though they would not be able to land in their full numbers all at the same time. Not wishing to spread themselves too thin, and with US air and naval power only capable of carving out a very small slice of safety on hostile Chinese beaches, US forces may at best approach the numbers of the amphibious assault in Normandy, averaging between 15,000 and 20,000 personnel per day. This would require a full three and a half days for an entire Marine Expeditionary Force to make the beach. This would leave 20,000 Marines with the unenviable task of holding a narrow strip of beach against a People's Liberation Army of around 975,000, not counting reservists and conscripts. Even with air superiority achieved, US and Allied aircraft could not hope to hold at bay the vast number of Chinese ground troops, and it's likely that even before the first Marine Expeditionary Force could completely offload onto the beach, the Marines holding them would have been thrown back out into the ocean. Sheer numbers alone make an invasion of the Chinese mainland completely impossible for even the technologically superior US, 
and it would require the unloading of an entire marine expeditionary force in one single landing to secure a foothold against the vast numbers of the Chinese People's Liberation Army. This is precisely why the United States has no plans of invading China, and instead plans on simply destroying the Chinese Navy and Air Force while blockading it economically in the case of war. In mid-June 2020, World War III started trending on Twitter again. This time, it was because a border dispute in the Himalayas between Chinese and Indian forces turned deadly, killing upward of 20 people. This is the first time since 1975 that the two countries have had a fatal conflict and the most serious skirmish since 1967. Naturally, as the two nations are populous, militarily powerful, and have nuclear capabilities, the world is biting its nails to see what happens next. But assuming the whole thing doesn't end in diplomacy or a world-consuming mushroom cloud, which country has what it takes to bring home a final victory? Using a mix of historical precedents of the prior conflicts between the two countries and our knowledge of their current military capabilities, we intend to find out exactly whether China or India would win if the two nations went to war today. After all, we're not just talking about dusty hypotheticals here. Relations between India and China have been extremely strained since the Sino-Indian War of 1962, which occurred over the same stretch of the Himalayan border that's causing conflicts today. India had granted the Dalai Lama asylum within their borders after the fallout of the 1959 Tibetan uprising, already putting them in China's bad books. And with China's military encroaching on the line of actual control, the demarcation line that separates Indian and Chinese territory in the Himalayas, a military skirmish was practically inevitable. The resulting conflict was short-lived, lasting only one month and one day between October and November of 1962. The People's Liberation Army of China had a vast numerical superiority over India's military forces, and India suffered significantly greater losses, with nearly double China's deaths, many wounded and over 3,000 captured. This loss is partly chalked up to the fact that it's believed, according to some leaked CIA documents, that India underestimated both China's military capabilities and their willingness to escalate the conflict. While India requested military assistance from the US in the form of 12 squadrons of fighter jets, their pleas were rejected, and India instead turned to Moscow for assistance. Ultimately, none of it did all that much good, as China claimed the Eastern Theater up to the line of actual control before declaring a unilateral ceasefire. India was left to lick its wounds, and tensions between the two countries have been high ever since, with conflict still breaking out well into the 70s. Both nations have ramped up militarization around the line of actual control as a show of strength, and this has left both with very little room to maneuver. In a sense, the Himalayan border is a military powder keg. And lately, we've been seeing the sparks. While a past record of military supremacy definitely works in China's favor, the Sino-Indian War was also 58 years ago, and failure is an excellent teacher. India has been engaged in frequent conflicts since the Sino-Indian War, giving their combatants invaluable battlefield experience. India is widely believed to have won every conflict they engaged in post-Sino-Indian War, with the exception of the Indo-Pakistani War of 1965, which ended in a ceasefire. China comparatively fought its last considerable conflict against Vietnamese forces in 1979. Once again, experience won out here as the Vietnamese, who'd recently honed their skills in battle against the forces of the United States, are largely considered to have handed China's asses to them. This is why the value of actual experience in war can never be overstated. But let's take a step back and look at what these two militaries have to offer in terms of manpower, technology, training, and resources. First, soldiers, the bread and butter of any military. Much like the Sino-Indian War, China has numerical superiority, though in India's defense, seeing as China is ranked as having the highest number of active military personnel in the world at 2,035,000. China's military has numerical superiority over literally everyone, with over 500,000 reserve personnel who could be easily called into action in a wartime scenario. China is a force to be reckoned with. India, however, isn't all that far behind, with 1,237,117 active personnel and an impressive 960,000 reserve personnel, putting the difference between their totals in the mere hundred thousands. But here's the big twist. The numbers here only pertain to the Indian Army, which is the ground force branch of the Indian Armed Forces, whose total number of active personnel are 1,444,500, second only to the PLA's total active personnel. However, the overall numbers of reserve personnel for the Indian Armed Forces now dwarfs China's at an astonishing 2.1 million. The Indian Navy boasts 67,252 active personnel and 55,000 reserves, 
The Indian Air Force has 139,576 active personnel and 140,000 reserves. In contrast to India's three-pronged system, the PLA consists of five branches – the Ground Force, Navy, Air Force, Rocket Force, and the Strategic Assault Force. The Ground Force is the Chinese infantry and land-based operations, with 975,000 active personnel. The PLA Navy has 240,000 active personnel, the Air Force even higher at 398,000 active personnel. The People's Liberation Army Rocket Force, also known by the pretty funny acronym PLARF, is the branch of the military in charge of the land-based ballistic and nuclear armaments. They have only 100,000 active personnel. And finally, the Strategic Assault Force. This is the newest branch of the PLA, established officially in 2015, dealing with extremely modern forms of warfare like space and cyber operations. This division is so new that we don't even have an exact number of active personnel. But due to the specialization of the job and the fact that the group is only five years old, it's safe to assume that it's likely the smallest branch of the PLA. However, we also have a far wider trend to consider here. The fact that China and India are two of the most populous nations on Earth, with populations of 1.393 billion and 1.353 billion respectively, as of 2018. In a situation of all-out war over their shared border, if both nations introduced conscription, the numerical differences between their armies would ultimately be nebulous. So if neither army would have an extreme numerical edge in the case of another conflict, let's zoom in and take a look at the average military service member in each infantry, specifically their training, equipment, and weaponry. Thankfully for India, they've grown to invest in more intensive military training over the years, including joint operations training with the British, US, Japanese, French, and Australian militaries as their involvement in the UN deepen. The Indian military has also consistently invested in modernized primary assault rifle systems for their troops, currently working with a mix of American Sig Sauer 716 assault rifles and an Indo-Russian AK-47-203, a modernization of the famously reliable and hardy AK-47. As of 2018, Indian infantry troops are fitted with SMPP ballistic armor, even capable of withstanding blasts from the steel core rounds fired out of an AK-47. All these factors add up to one formidable individual soldier. China's infantry troops don't have quite the same thing going for them. Modern Chinese military training has been criticized for years for its lack of useful applications in real-life combat scenarios, meaning the average military skills of a Chinese infantryman may leave something to be desired compared to their Indian counterparts. They're formidable in the rifle department with the QBZ-95-1, a reliable bullpup rifle which performs best at long range. However, despite China being one of the world's most prolific exporters of body armor, it hasn't historically fitted its troops with that same standard of protection. The PLA is notorious for its light loadout, often leaving soldiers ill-prepared for taking fire and giving the Indian infantry troops a huge comparative advantage. However, this may change in the not-too-distant future. According to a report from Global Times, China is investing heavily in updating and modernizing its training system, as well as planning on procuring 1.4 million units of high-quality body armor for the PLA. While this isn't currently a certainty, if these plans do go through, any advantages that the Indian Army may have had on an individual soldier level would essentially evaporate, leaving them dead even once again. But these days, war is far more complex than a large group of armed men running at each other and fighting down to the last one standing. In modern warfare, technology can give militaries the crucial edge they need to secure a victory over the enemy. Since 2008, China and India have ranked second and third, respectively, in global military spending, but the gap between them is still pretty immense. Last year, China spent an astonishing $261 billion on military development, compared to India's far smaller $71.1 billion. This disparity becomes a little more natural when you realize that China's economy is five times the size of India's. Let's take a look at how these numbers actually translate into vehicles for their armies, navies, and air forces. While China is generally packing more hardware than India, one exception is in the world of tanks, where India's over 4,200 stands over 1,000 units greater than China's 3,200 plus tanks. However, this doesn't paint the whole picture of China's ground capabilities. If we're looking at the number of armored ground vehicles overall, China's 33,000 dwarfs India's 8,600, giving them considerable ground superiority, bolstered by the fact that they have 10 times more rocket projectors than their Indian counterparts. China also holds dominance over the skies, with 3,210 aircraft compared to India's 2,123. It also has approximately double the fighter and interceptor jets and 507 workable airports compared to India's 346. 
Once again, sadly for India, this trend continues into the country's navies. In terms of total naval assets, China outnumbers India by 777 to 285. More specifically, it has 74 submarines to India's 16, 36 destroyers to India's 11, and if wars were decided on equipment alone, it's unquestionable that China would take the win here. Of course, while nobody on Earth wants the conflict to escalate to this point for the sake of all human life, we'd be remiss to not return to the fact that China and India are both nuclear nations. If the war ever did become an exchange of nuclear force, who would come out on top? Well, for a number of reasons, China has a clear edge here. Not only did they develop their nuclear capabilities just over a decade earlier than India in 1964, New Delhi wouldn't have its first nuke until 1975, but their nuclear arsenal is also double the size of India's with a far quicker growth rate. China has a stockpile of 320 nuclear warheads, having grown by 40 in the past year. Compare this to India with only 150 nuclear warheads which grew by a mere 10 in the past year. Both nations can deploy these warheads via the nuclear triad of missiles, submarines, and bombers, and thankfully for the human race, both have a no-first-strike policy. This means the warheads can only be used in retaliation to another nuclear attack, making it less likely that either country would want to strike first. Of course, if either did, all of us would ultimately lose from the resulting radioactive firefight. But on sheer numbers, China takes the clear win with regard to nuclear capabilities. One final factor worth considering is one that's rarely mentioned in a lot of abstract military planning – allies. While it's easy to think of war purely in terms of enemies, your diplomatic and military friends can also be a make-or-break factor in determining the outcome of a conflict. While China could largely be working a solo war against India with the exception of perhaps Pakistan, a country with fraught relationships with India to say the least. India itself has been building diplomatic relationships with a number of extremely valuable allies. These include the United States, a country with the highest military spending in the world, who under President Trump have gone cold on relations with China while referring to India as a major defense partner. India has also developed strong diplomatic ties to Japan, France, and Australia through performing a number of joint military drills with all of them. Having these various world powers behind them gives India a serious combat edge over China, providing these allies come to India's side in their time of need. While the US could be India's greatest ally in this speculative war, foreign policy under President Trump has been known to be capricious and unreliable to other allies, such as the Kurdish forces in Syria in 2019. So there's really no way of telling for sure. So back to our big question. Who would win in a modern conflict between India and China? Turns out, it's a lot more complex than you may have thought. While a layman might assume that China's apparent numerical and monetary advantages handed an easy win, these advantages can be neutralized by India's stronger troops, who are better equipped, better trained, and more experienced, and its greater network of powerful allies. Then there's the strategic picture, as while the Indian Navy is smaller than the Chinese Navy, India itself is situated on the jugular of Chinese trade, so to speak. Chinese trade ships must pass through the Indian Ocean to reach their destinations, and while China may have a larger fleet, it's not very well equipped to conduct operations far from its own shores. With only two aircraft carriers with a capacity of about 24 aircraft between them, and one not even being operational yet, any Chinese incursion into the Indian Ocean to protect its trade fleets would be disastrous, as the Chinese task force would be brutally pounded by Indian air and naval power. With China receiving the bulk of its oil from maritime trade routes, a protracted war between the two nations would inevitably cripple the Chinese military and industry both. India would simply have to fight defensively, as the terrain separating India and China is extremely difficult and well suited to defensive warfare. While the Chinese could crush any Indian incursion into China itself, and there'd be few strategic targets to take close to the Indian border anyway, a war between the two nations would inevitably see India the winner as it slowly strangles Chinese trade to death. In the year 2020, the US is still the world's sole superpower, but China is not far behind. Both nations have huge amounts of influence across the globe and economies that generate enormous wealth. But what about their militaries? If China and the United States were to go to war, who would have the advantage? In this military comparison, we're pitting China's People's Liberation Army against the United States military to see how they match up. After we lay out the capabilities of each, we'll decide who will win in an all-out war. Bear in mind that both of these militaries are always changing, so it's important to keep an eye on the future. In the end, it'll all come down to which country has the stronger and smarter military. Let's see if you come to the same conclusion we do of who would win in a war between China and the United States of America.
In terms of resources, China and the US are both well equipped to support their militaries during the war. It's well known that the United States spends more money than any other country on its military. The most recent military budget for the United States was around $721 billion. That's more than many countries' entire GDP. On the other hand, China's military budget is around $178 billion. Notice the huge contrast between the two nations' military spending. Just in pure spending, the United States beats China. But just because a country spends a lot of money does not mean they have the better military equipment or personnel. Although the United States invests more money in their military, China leads with a different resource, manpower. If all-out war happened, the ability to manufacture weapons and replenish casualties would be vital. The current population of the United States is just over 330 million people. The population of China? Around 1.5 billion people. Of course, not everyone in each population would be able to fight or work in factories, but just in terms of people, China vastly outnumbers the US. This brings us to the active number of military personnel in each country. Who has the bigger military? Well, it should come as no surprise that the number of soldiers in China's military is much larger than the United States. With more people in the country, there are more people in the military. In fact, the number of military personnel in China is almost double the amount of military personnel in the United States. The US military consists of around 1.3 million personnel on active duty. The People's Liberation Army has just over 2 million military personnel. If war broke out between the two countries, the United States would need to immediately reinstate the draft. Just to come close to matching the number of military personnel the People's Liberation Army currently has. Due to the immense size of the Pacific Ocean, a war between China and the US would most likely not start on land. So let's first look at the Air Force capabilities of each nation and how they stack up against one another. The total number of military aircraft the United States has is around 5,370. China's Air Force contains about 3,010 planes, but these numbers are always fluctuating as new planes are built and old aircraft are retired. Right now, the Chinese military is building and purchasing aircraft much faster than the US. It's estimated that in a few years, the number of aircraft between the two nations will be comparable. But what about the types of aircraft? Which country has better fighter planes, bombers, and transports? The United States has a vast array of aircraft at their disposal, the most impressive of which are the F-35 Lightning, F-22 Raptor, and F-15 Eagle. These fighter jets help the US maintain air superiority. However, China has its own stealth fighter in the J-20, although it's only available in extremely low numbers and is generally considered a poor man's version of the American F-35. In the air, the American military still retains a lethal advantage over the Chinese military with more sophisticated avionics, a much larger fleet of fifth-generation aircraft, and a far greater number of support aircraft such as tankers and AWACS platforms. American pilots also train on average 20 to 30 hours more per year than their Chinese counterparts and in more realistic scenarios than the Chinese. As we look at other aspects of the Air Force in each country, we find that larger aircraft such as bombers and transports are not equal. The United States has a clear advantage. There are two reasons for this. The first is because the US just has more aircraft. The second reason is because a lot of money being pumped in the United States military goes to research and development each year. The United States aircrafts are up to date, while the Chinese Air Force is still working with functional but older models. You don't need to look much further than the United States' Boeing B-52 Stratofortress, Northrop B-2 Spirit, and Rockwell B-1 Lancer to show that in terms of dominating ground targets from the air, the US has the advantage. Other than the skies, the next most important military technology in a war between China and the US would be the Navy. Controlling the oceans in this conflict would be vital for success. One of the most important ships in a naval arsenal would be the aircraft carrier. The floating fortresses would be crucial to launching airstrikes on the opposing country. Currently, the United States is the world leader in aircraft carriers. The US has 11 active aircraft carriers, while China only has two, and only one of those is currently rated as combat ready. This clearly puts dominance of the ocean in favor of the United States military. But what about other warships? If China could destroy the US aircraft carriers, would they have the advantage? The United States currently has around 430 naval ships on active and reserve duty. However, only about 300 of those ships are currently able to deploy at a moment's notice. If war broke out between China and the United States right now, China would have a fleet of 335 ships to call upon. But just like the case for the US, not every ship would be available for combat, with about 20% on each side being currently undergoing maintenance, retrofit, or rest and relaxation for its crews. Without eliminating the US's aircraft carrier fleet, China would stand no chance of victory in the Pacific if all-out conflict took place. Yet even with American carriers out of action, 
China would be extremely hard-pressed to deal with the American submarine fleet. While it has its own fleet of 74 subs versus the US's 66, China severely lacks in anti-submarine warfare assets and would be ill-equipped to take on America's silent service. On the American side, a disastrous performance by its own anti-submarine warfare assets during exercises in the early 2000s revealed a terrible crumbling of the American Navy's capability to wage anti-submarine warfare after the end of the Cold War. Since then, and with the help of ultra-silent diesel submarines from partner nations, the US has undertaken great steps to once again bolster its ASW capabilities and is believed to be well prepared to face any enemy fleet as the world prepares for great power competitions once again. For now, the US fleet remains supreme, but it's divided between responsibilities around the world, while China can focus the entirety of its efforts in fighting America's Pacific fleet alone. With a rapidly modernizing fleet and more sophisticated shipbuilding efforts, China looks set to close the gap between itself and the US in the approaching decades. What would happen if the war made its way to land, though? Obviously, it would depend on where the war was being fought. The nation battling on their home turf would ultimately have the advantage because of their ability to replenish land forces more easily. Let's take location out of the equation and just compare the land-based military capabilities of each nation. We know that in terms of soldiers, China outnumbers the US. We also know that if soldier numbers need to be replenished, there are many more people to choose from in China than in the US. Basically, if the two countries went to war using only soldiers, the United States would eventually succumb to the large number of available manpower China has. That being said, this is not how wars are fought anymore. Instead, land battles can be won using machinery, such as tanks. The United States has a tank arsenal of around 8,010 vehicles. The US's main battle tank is the legendary M1 Abrams, of which not a single one has been lost to enemy action yet. If deployed, the United States tank army would be a devastating force. It would plow through anything in its path. China has fewer tanks at around 6,560 and just under half of those are first-generation tanks dating back to the early Cold War era. Around 2,360 of the Chinese tanks are Type 59s. These tanks were produced in the 50s and 60s. They are antiquated and currently retired but still kept in reserve. This means that the tank force of China is actually much smaller than the United States'. The US pours billions of dollars into upgrading their tanks with state-of-the-art equipment and keeping their forces modernized. Clearly, the United States would decimate China in a tank battle. In today's day and age, battles are rarely fought only on the ground. At some point, they may not even be fought on the planet. Recently, the United States has implemented a new branch of the military, Space Force. Space Force's mission is to organize, train, and equip Space Forces in order to protect US and allied interests in space and to provide space capabilities to the Joint Force. It is clear that the United States is moving toward militarizing this new horizon. But is China? Recent reports have shown that China has been rapidly expanding its space program. They were the third country to launch a human into space behind the former Soviet Union, now Russia, and the United States. China completed this feat back in 2003 and has since ramped up their space program. They are the first and only country to put a rover on the far side of the moon, where they've made several discoveries. China has also been launching more and more satellites and military spacecraft into space in recent years. It's estimated that China has more than 320 satellites, 105 of them are military in nature. The United States has around 123 military satellites, even though the US has been in space much longer than China. It would seem that the breakthroughs at the China National Space Administration have greatly sped up the military satellite capabilities of the country. The budget for NASA in the United States has been cut year after year, almost immediately after they put the first man on the moon. China's space program, on the other hand, seems to be getting an influx of money each year from the government. How long until the research and development of China's engineers and space scientists surpass the US? In space, the country with the best technology and most knowledge of the environment will be victorious in battle. If the United States continues to fall behind in space exploration, they will not stand a chance in the space war with China. This brings us to our last comparison between the two countries, a comparison that has no winner. Instead, everyone loses. We're talking about nuclear weapons. As of right now, China has an estimated total of 320 nuclear warheads. That might seem like a lot, but it is nothing compared to the amount of nuclear weapons the United States has stockpiled. The United States has about 6,370 nuclear warheads under its control. 2,000 of those nukes are awaiting to be dismantled and disposed of. However, if nuclear war broke out between China and the US, neither country would get a chance to use all their nuclear weapons. The human race would be annihilated long before then. 
So it's probably in China's and the United States' and the entire world's best interest that nuclear war never comes. Although the United States has a slight military advantage over China, we can't underestimate how far China's military has come in a relatively short amount of time. Also, the vast amount of manpower could be enough to allow China to hold out for a long time slowly depleting the United States' resources. However, the reason we believe that the United States would win a war with China is because of experience. The United States has a lot more military experience than China. This means that the leaders of the military have seen combat and know what works and what doesn't. The US has been at war almost perpetually in one form or another since World War II, most recently in the Middle East. Since the beginning of Desert Storm in 1991, the United States has maintained a military presence in the Middle East. In fact, the United States has been fighting in Afghanistan for almost 18 years. This means military personnel and leaders have constantly been gaining skills and experience in the art of war. China, on the other hand, has not fought in a war in over 40 years. The last war they fought in was in 1979 when China invaded Vietnam. Vietnam had just come out of its own civil war and had gained much experience during that time. The small country was able to humiliate the Chinese military, forcing them out of their country after only three weeks. It seems that experience can outweigh sheer numbers during wartime. It is for this reason that we believe the United States would win a war with China if it were fought today. However, and some of you might have already seen this coming, if China continues to expand and upgrade their military as they have been doing in recent years, it will not be long before their military strength surpasses the United States. If this happens, it's a very real possibility that China would win a war against the United States in the future. Their drive to update their machinery and technology can be seen in their space program and the expansion of their military. Within the next decade, we at the Infographics Show may need to make a new video to reevaluate this military comparison between China and the United States, with the winner being the People's Liberation Army of China. The date is July 2019, and rumors of a military buildup of Chinese forces across the strait from Taiwan begin to leak to the international press. As the 4th of July is celebrated here at home, thousands of miles away, Taiwan begins to move their command and control functions into hardened nuclear-proof underground facilities. F-16s and other strike aircraft are moved into mountain bases, and dummy missile batteries and anti-aircraft platforms are set up around the island of Taiwan. August rolls around, and by now it's clear to the world that China is indeed massing what looks like an invasion force on its side of the Taiwan Strait. Though the Chinese leader Xi Jinping reassures the world that he's only interested in a peaceful reunification of Taiwan and the mainland. The American military is put at DEFCON 3, which signals the Air Force to be ready to mobilize for a potential nuclear conflict in just 15 minutes. As September comes, the Chinese military has begun commandeering civilian ships in order to help move its one million man strong invasion force across the channel. The Chinese military lacks the amphibious capability to move more than a few thousand troops at a time, but in order to face 100,000 Taiwanese defenders and their two million reservists, the People's Liberation Army will need every available ship it can get its hands on, no matter how big or small. Across the strait, Taiwan has begun littering the only 13 beaches that an invasion force could be landed on with mines, razor wire, and other horrific surprises. The US Pacific Fleet is fully mobilized by now, and the United States is at DEFCON 2. All military leave is cancelled, and Marines board transports as they head for bases in Australia, Japan, and Guam. PACCOM's carrier groups disperse a thousand miles offshore from Taiwan, careful to make sure that they do not stray too deep into the net of ballistic missile coverage that China uses to threaten American naval vessels. There's no hiding China's intentions now. An invasion of Taiwan is coming, and the entire world knows it. Taiwanese troops, supplemented by a few thousand rapid response American forces, dig in for what will be the largest amphibious assault in history. The date is October 3, 2019. The seas between Taiwan and China are finally calm again, presenting a narrow four-week opportunity for an amphibious assault that only reoccurs briefly one other time of the year in May. Chinese troops are rushed to waiting transports. The lucky ones board military amphibious landing craft, while the unlucky ones must make the treacherous crossing on civilian boats with little if any protection. Overhead, hundreds of missiles fly out over the strait, slamming into radar, communications, and control nodes all over the island. Airfields are cratered. Civilian power plants are destroyed. Chinese jets scream overhead en route to strike at Taiwanese tanks and artillery pieces, shortly after followed by Chinese bombers. Yet the Taiwanese Air Force has long been redeployed to underground facilities, and American-made F-16s flown by Taiwanese pilots rise up to meet the incoming Chinese planes. 
A thousand miles away, US carrier battle groups are given the green light to advance to forward positions just off the Taiwan coast, bringing a significant portion of America's naval air power. They alone are more than a match for the Chinese Air Force. Yet as they steam ahead, a rain of ballistic missiles falls upon the battle groups. Anti-missile defense systems intercept many, yet others manage to slip through and deal devastating blows against American supercarriers. In moments, thousands of American sailors are dead. And in the first five minutes of the war, more American servicemen have died than in all conflicts combined since Vietnam. By the end of the first month of fighting, American casualties will reach Vietnam war levels, with Chinese and Taiwanese casualties many times that number. By the end of 2019, the war will officially be the bloodiest conflict since World War II. But could such a war really happen, and if it did, could you actually be drafted to fight in it? The sad answer is yes, and in fact, American military planners consider the Taiwan-China situation to be one of the several flashpoints that would lead directly to a third world war. China, for its part, has long claimed that it seeks only a peaceful reunification with the island nation. Yet just in 2016, Xi Jinping stated, we have the determination, the ability, and the preparedness to deal with Taiwanese independence, and if we do not deal with it, we will be overthrown. China views Taiwan's continued independence as more than the historical thorn in its side, but now rather as a direct threat to the mainland's continued communist leadership. This is because the island nation has only grown more prosperous and economically powerful over the decades, becoming the 19th largest economy in the world. Taiwan also directly employs many mainland Chinese citizens, either on the island itself or in off-site factories and offices run by Taiwanese businesses. The same cannot be said in large numbers of China's influence on Taiwan. Yet even more dangerous than Taiwan's prosperity is what Xi Jinping and Chinese leadership fear the most. It's liberal democracy. Taiwan's liberal democratic values completely undermined China's own hardline nationalistic values. While China enforces strict censorship, Taiwan espouses the same liberal values that America does, and mainland Chinese have begun to take notice. Pro-democracy demonstrations continue to grow within China, and as Chinese citizens spend more time abroad both in Taiwan and Europe and America, they are starting to bring democratic values back home with them. For China, Taiwan's continued independence is a deathly threat that must one day be eliminated, and increasingly, it looks like plans to eliminate Taiwan's independence are to do so by force. Yet, if China were to launch a war against Taiwan, currently one of the likeliest conflicts that the US actively prepares for, then America would be treaty bound to defend the island democracy. This would pit the two largest economies and military powers in the world against each other. And while the US would inevitably come out slightly ahead of China, casualties on both sides would be staggering. To this end, America would immediately need to boost its active military forces. The first step in bolstering American forces would be an immediate call-up of all reservists. With 860,000 reservists, any draft notices would likely not come for a while. Yet, depending on the scale of the war and America's objectives, a draft may ultimately be inevitable. Currently, America has two objectives to achieve in any conflict with China. The first being the complete destruction of its air and naval forces, and the second being the toppling of its communist government. The total destruction of all Chinese naval and air forces are a non-negotiable objective, meaning that no matter how the war went, unless it somehow went extremely poorly for the US, there would be no negotiations for a ceasefire until this objective was met. The US would direct all of its efforts and resources at ensuring that no Chinese naval or air forces survive the conflict. And the reasoning is quite simple. China cannot hope to fight a second war if its navy and air force is destroyed, and a lengthy rearmament period would take a decade or more, giving ample opportunity for the US and allies to rearm themselves. The removal of China's communist government is an ancillary objective, which would be carried out via precision strikes, covert operations, and psychological operations aimed at the Chinese citizenry. Given that a purely military removal of China's government would require a full-scale land invasion, the US is happy to wage a war and not meet this objective, or leave it in the hands of a civilian population riled up by aggressive psychological operations. In the first scenario, it's unlikely that a draft would be instigated by the US government, given the US's advantages in naval and air forces both. 
Though both the American Navy and Air Force would suffer significant losses in the effort, China would indubitably face the complete annihilation of its own Navy and Air Force to the Americans and their allies. In this case, reservists would likely be enough to bring American combat strength back to manageable levels, and a draft would be highly unlikely. Yet, if the scope of the conflict expanded for any reason, and a direct removal of China's communist government was the only road to peace, an American draft would be a necessity. With over 2 million active duty forces in the Chinese military, the US and its allies would need to bolster their own numbers significantly to even attempt an invasion of China. All male American citizens and immigrant non-citizens between the ages of 18 and 25 are required by law to register in the selective service system. In 2010, the SSS had over 16 million young American men on file. Yet the US has a total fit-for-service manpower pool of over 111 million. With an increasingly bloody conflict against China, the SSS would without a doubt be activated, and full-rate conscription would begin for the first time since Vietnam. War with China is not likely, and yet it is considered the most realistic and probable flashpoint for the world's next major war. While the world has not seen any major powers go to war since the end of World War II, and it will hopefully not see them do so ever again, the reality is that several of any possible diplomatic missteps in the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait could lead to an unavoidable conflict between the US and China. And with the life of the Chinese Communist Party likely dependent on forcing Taiwan back into the fold and crushing the island's democratic government, the US may be headed straight for another military draft sooner than any of us could have hoped for. Early in its invasion of Ukraine, when the world turned a collective cold shoulder to it, Russia claimed that the Russian-Chinese partnership was one of no limits. Not long after, the Chinese were quick to rectify the sentiment and make it clear that there were indeed limits to this relationship, with its only real friends being Iran and North Korea. If Russia wants to win the war in Ukraine, it desperately needs China's support, but China has other plans, and it would like nothing better than if Russia lost this war. And not just any loss, the more catastrophic the better. Russia's war to defeat Russia by invading Ukraine is putting the nation in an increasingly tough position as the conflict enters the 18-month mark. Initially, sanctions against the country barely made a dent on its economy thanks to booming energy revenues as the Western world bought up vast reserves of Russian energy in order to shore up for looming sanctions. But the boom times are over, and now Western price caps on Russian energy are gutting government revenues. These price caps allow Russia just enough leeway to keep selling oil and gas and thus avoid a global energy crisis, but not enough for Russia to turn a profit. In effect, Russia's greatest source of revenue has been reduced to a break-even state, even as the country taxes oil income according to the price of Brent crude rather than its own. This is cannibalizing its own energy industry just to continue financing the costly war in Ukraine. Even worse, as Russia switched to sell oil to India, they tried to make up its losses of Western business, and the Indian government demanded that all sales be made in rupees instead of rubles. This has left Russia with a massive quantity of Indian rupees, which have very limited use on the international market as most nations trade in either dollars or euro. Russia also doesn't need much of what India is willing to export, meaning it can't use those rupees to buy the Indian goods it might need. This growing stockpile of rupees is effectively worthless to Russia, unless the world suddenly switches to the rupee as the global reserve currency in the near future. On top of income woes, Russia is dealing with a catastrophic shortage of badly needed products for the manufacture of advanced weapons. Sanctions on semiconductor sales to Russia have reduced its military to scrounging for chips from consumer goods like dishwashers, and it's being forced to buy drones from countries like Iran under deals that heavily favor Iran. In the wake of the Russian invasion in Ukraine, the world learned that while Russia is a huge arms exporter, it was extremely reliant on advanced components from around the world to actually produce sophisticated arms. Without those components, the Russian defense industry can only manage to chug out a few advanced weapon systems per month, an estimated 20 tanks per month, for example, and in a questionable state of modernity to boot. China has helped alleviate some of the pressure that Russia is currently under. It has greatly expanded its import of Russian energy in the wake of Western sanctions and allows Russia to use its own financial institutions to undertake some transactions and evade Western restrictions. Further, there's good intelligence announced by the Americans that Chinese defense firms have been providing vital equipment to the Russian war effort. It was long feared that China would announce their full-blown support for Russia in a similar style as Ukraine enjoys from the West. Everything from Chinese tanks to artillery and especially missiles were feared to be crossing the border into Russia, replenishing its stockpiles and significantly expanding Russia's ability to continue waging this war. 
Despite Ukraine's many successes, it remains outgunned and outmanned by the vastly larger Russian military, which has the good fortune of access to vast stocks of Cold War equipment that still enjoys some battlefield utility. But those stocks are increasingly running out, and China was feared to be the key to replenishing Russian shortages. So far, there's been no sign of heavy equipment being transferred to Russia, despite President Vladimir Putin doubtlessly asking for it during his meetings with China's Xi Jinping. What we do know is that there is increasing evidence that the Chinese government is actively aiding Russia in evading sanctions, transferring large amounts of dual-use hardware like drones and computer chips to feed its ever-hungry defense industry. Chinese state-owned defense companies have shipped everything from badly needed spare parts for combat jets to navigation equipment. And just between March and July of 2023, Chinese companies sold Russia over $12 million in drones and drone parts. For their part, the Chinese have claimed that they're not selling Russia any weapons, which so far seems to be true. However, they also claim that any dual-use items being transferred to Russia are, quote, above board. This is objectively false, given that it took U.S. intelligence and third-party researchers to begin to discover the scope of what China is supplying to Russia. But it's not just parts that could be used in military drones that China is sneaking into Russia. China is now the largest importer of Russian oil in the world, dethroning India for that title in March of 2023. While Russia has not been able to make up all it lost in sales to the West, China now imports twice the amount of liquefied petroleum gas than it did in 2021, and crude oil imports are around 1.65 million barrels a day. One of the most painful blows to the Russian economy was sanctions by the West which forbade Western insurance agencies from insuring any ship used to transport Russian oil. This meant that Russia didn't just lose access to European tanker fleets, but to international fleets insured by European companies. That left it with few options with which to ship oil, given that pipelines to alternate markets are few and so specialized that only very specific products could be sent through them anyway. But here too, China's helping Russia out by providing its own super tankers and granting insurance to third-party tankers transferring Russian energy goods. According to an anonymous Chinese executive, China provided 18 super tankers and insured a further 16 third-party vessels in 2023, shipping 15 million metric tons of crude oil. It looks like short of providing Russia with weapons, China's doing everything it can to help Russia win. But on closer inspection, this is far from the truth because the truth is, China is only interested in China, and even its aid to Russia is completely in its own interest, and it comes at an increasingly high cost to Russia's continued independence. Now that last part is not a flaw, it's a feature of Chinese aid. China's been accused of using its Belt and Road Economic Initiative to spread what some have called, quote, debt trap diplomacy. There's varying levels of truth to this, but when looking at China's alleged support for Russia, it's hard to not see how China has its own interests front and center, to the great detriment of the Russians. Firstly, most of the transactions between Russia and China are now being conducted with the Chinese Yuan, with the amount of total Russian exports conducted in Yuan increasing from half a percentage point pre-war to 14% today. This is both a reflection of Russia's increasing shift toward Chinese markets and the Chinese demanding that trade be conducted in their own currency, strengthening the Chinese Yuan directly. For the first time in history, the Chinese Yuan is the most used currency inside of China itself for cross-border transactions. Globally, the Yuan, or renminbi, rose to 2.7% of global foreign exchange reserves in 2022. This is good news for China, but bad news for Russia, since, like its situation with India, it's now left with huge cash reserves of a currency that only a very small amount of global trade is undertaken with. At least China's more sophisticated economy is able to offer Russia more of the goods and services it needs and thus provide a chance to use those yuan reserves, but it can't provide everything, still leaving Russia with significant yuan reserves it cannot do much with. But the bigger picture overall is one where Russia is effectively forced to sell its energy for two currencies that the vast majority of the world doesn't do business with, meaning that the longer Russia is left under sanctions, the more dependent it becomes on India and China, since those are the only two currencies it has left in significant reserves, and nobody else wants them. China's political support is likewise completely self-serving. When Russia announced its No Limits partnership, China was quick to correct the record in order to not offend the West, where it has significant investments. To date, Chinese support has been tepid at best, with the nation calling for a quote, equitable peace for both sides. What exactly that entails remains ambiguous, with China careful to word its 12-point peace plan in a way that leaves it completely unclear as to how it views a valid resolution to the war in Ukraine. In point number one, 
China calls for both parties to observe the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of all countries, but this peace plan was presented after Russia annexed eastern Ukraine. So, does China support returning Ukrainian sovereignty to the annexed provinces or does it support Russian claims of sovereignty? Nobody but the Chinese know, leaving their position pleasantly ambiguous, to their own benefit and to the detriment of Russia. With most of the world not recognizing its annexation of Ukrainian territory, Russia needs a significant world power to recognize its claims or it'll lose them entirely. But as the world becomes increasingly polarized between liberal democracies and authoritarian dictatorships, why would China not fully embrace a like-minded authoritarian state? Why, in reality, does China want Russia to lose the war in Ukraine? It all comes down to what China needs in order to continue prospering and pursue its ultimate goal of dethroning the US as the sole global superpower. And Russia has everything China needs to accomplish this. Relations between the two states have varied wildly from warm friendship during the first part of the Cold War to mutual distrust and even outright border conflicts in the second half. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia was still the big boy on the block and China the junior partner but the Chinese dragon has completely overtaken the Russian bear, with China now dwarfing it not just economically but politically and militarily as well. Russia's only remaining advantage over China is its nuclear arsenal, but with the state of the military on full display in Ukraine, there are serious questions as to the efficacy of an arsenal even bigger than that of the US. China's working to close that gap too, with massive investment in nuclear weapons in recent years, much to the world's detriment. China has a long memory of its treatment as a junior partner by the Soviet Union superpower, and continued by Russia until recently. It also remembers the territory stolen from it by the Russian Empire in 1858, under a set of humiliating treaties forced upon the Qin Dynasty by the Russians. Russian Manchuria now includes the Amur Oblast and the southern half of the Khabarovsky Krai. It's not just national pride at stake, though, as Russian Manchuria happens to not just be strategically important, but also rich in energy resources and, most importantly, water. With China experiencing significant droughts, water shortages have put huge pressure on the nation, and the territory stolen from it by the Russian Empire happens to have two of the resources it needs most today. Russian Manchuria is only the tip of Chinese ambitions, though, because the greater prize is the entire Russian Far East. The RFE contains massive quantities of energy and other resources that remain largely unexplored and untapped. It is exactly these resources China is eyeing hungrily. Not only would it dramatically bolster the Chinese economy, but having access to those energy stockpiles would create a secure overland energy supply route directly to China. This is of significant concern, when today China faces the very real prospect of having the US Navy completely blockade its sea-based trade which accounts for approximately 60% of its energy imports. Without the ability to challenge the US Navy far from its own shores, having a vast supply of energy delivered via secure land routes would suddenly give China a lot of freedom to pursue some of its most aggressive foreign policy goals that the United States currently keeps in check, such as invading and annexing Taiwan. For its part, Russia has not helped Chinese ambitions in the region much. In 2014, Russia launched its Arctic Development Plan and did not include any Chinese involvement, nor did they make any mention of plans to prioritize Chinese energy needs. That's all changed as Russia has turned to China to finance significant infrastructure and energy exploration in the region. For the Russian political elite in Moscow, the situation is increasingly alarming. Not only are Russia's energy resources in its most far-flung region being financed by the Chinese, but China's own investments into the Russian Far East overall vastly outstrip its investments by the Russian federal government. Immigration, both legal and illegal, is creating a population that is increasingly more Chinese than Russian. In 20 to 30 years, it's feared that there will be more ethnic Chinese in the RFE than Russians, a concerning situation given the 113 million Chinese are sitting right across the border in neighboring Chinese provinces. Tensions between local Russians and Chinese populations are already nearing a boiling point. There's a deep resentment over the growing crowds of Chinese tourists who are said to be rude and patronize only Chinese businesses. In 2019, tensions came to a fever pitch over a Chinese-owned bottling plant on Lake Baikal, which is the world's deepest lake and holds 20% of the global freshwater supply. This Chinese plant would not only block local access to the water supply, but ship that water to China, where it's desperately needed. The Russian outrage was so pronounced that plans to build the plant were deemed illegal in Russian court. China's not done much to ease tensions and in fact seems to have signaled intentions to eventually retake Russian Manchuria. In 2023, Beijing approved the creation of official maps 
which showed the territories surrendered under the Qin dynasty under Chinese control and with their old Chinese names. The statement was clear, China wants what Russia has. And this is why China needs Russia to lose this war. And the worse it loses, the better. Russia is unlikely to simply allow demographics to shift ownership of the RFE from itself to China, even as a growing Chinese population creates an opportunity for an independence movement or an annexation by China. It is ironically exactly how Russia claimed justification for invading Ukraine, the protection of Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine. In another decade or two, China will have this exact same justification to move to annex the RFE, a region that's not just increasingly ethnically Chinese, but financially too. While China could absolutely defeat Russia in a conventional war, Russia is unlikely to let the RFE go peacefully and could resort to nuclear weapons to defend its territory. This is where a crippling loss in Ukraine would be to China's advantage, as such a loss would likely come with significant political upheaval, exactly the type of chaos China could use to make a move on the RFE, consolidating its hold before a fractured Russian state could properly react. In the end, it'd be a fitting fate for Russia to have its own territory annexed by a belligerent neighbor, but it would be a significant setback for the liberal world order, which has relied on the US Navy's ability to control Chinese trade to keep its worst ambitions in check. Now check out What If China Attacked Russia, or click this other video instead.